Notice that this meeting has been provided by posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission. So all persons entitled to same is provided by law of a schedule including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call, please. Councilman Howard. Here. Councilman Newton. Here. Councilman Pucciarelli. Here. Councilman Seaton. Here. And Mayor Aronson. Here. Please join us as we salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join us now in a moment of silence as we honor the American men and women serving the armed forces as well as those serving as first responders. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our special public meeting. Uh, we have a very focused meeting tonight to talk about uh, impact studies for in the, in the context of the multifamily housing issue. Uh, we had originally scheduled this meeting for last week, and we've moved it at the request of residents. Uh, and the reason we're having it in this venue is because the zoning board, I believe, is the zoning board having a meeting? Well, yeah, they, they are. Okay. Uh, and the feeling was if we had an overflow crowd, we couldn't fit them in the room on the uh, Right, so we're here to handle the overflow crap. <laughs> we'll start with comments from the public. Uh, five minutes a person, 30 minutes in total, and then we'll move forward. Uh, we'll hand, the, hand it over to the village manager and village CFO to take us through the presentations. If anyone wants to stand, to the, stand up to the podium. All right. Good evening, welcome. Welcome. Sorry, I thought I had tickets for January. Uh, Dave Sloman, 36 Heights Road. Just a quick couple of points here. Um, I'm glad we're having this meeting. Thank you for rescheduling. I know it's not a big crowd. I think some more folks will be coming in. But the folks that are here and will be coming wouldn't have been able to be here on Friday. And I think it's important. We will share information from this meeting. And I think that's important as well. To, have special public meetings on nights when uh, people can at least have the option to be there. Um, <clears throat> tonight, in doing these studies, uh, I think it's a great step forward, something at least three years overdue. Uh, and I know uh, Councilwoman Howe and the mayor have used the word opportunity often in relation to some of the high density housing proposals, the garage. Um, at Citizens for a Better Ridgewood, uh, where I'm an uh, ardent supporter of all the work that they and we are doing, we feel an opportunity is for master planning. And I think this is almost an ad hoc piece of some great master planning that can start happening now. And I think it's really long overdue. The funny thing is possibly, uh, I know one of the issues has been cost. Perhaps if this had started uh, a few years ago with these comprehensive impact studies uh, when the master, when the uh, ordinances were still at the master plan, at the uh, planning board level, uh, we could have gotten some of the funding under uh, 3066. Um, that said, as a taxpayer, I'm willing to go to the mass for whatever it costs for these things and however long it takes to do these. This is so important. These decisions are going to impact our village for decades. They're going to define the village for decades. We should take as much time as needed. I know I've, I've seen that we need to get these things, I've heard we have to get these things done by March. It's a lot of work to get done in a little amount of time for decisions that will impact the town for decades. I ask that you please, in questioning, in, in uh, contracting these studies, in questioning these studies, designing these studies, please look at them, not how can we get them done as quickly as possible or even as cheaply as possible. If we screw it up, it's going to cost us a lot more than tens of thousands of dollars right now, or whatever it might cost. Um, if we get it right, we could have a phenomenal, wonderful village for many decades to come. So please, don't put an artificial time on it. Um, let's get it right. Uh, ask so we can ask all the right questions. If as in the garage study that we just found out about for traffic, it raised two important questions. We need to look at the intersections of Broad and Ridgewood and Broad and Franklin. 
let's have the time to, to look into that, ask those further questions, and get them answered before we make decisions that will impact the village for decades to come. Uh, so, uh, I guess that, that's pretty much it. Please look at this as part of a master planning process that should be happening, should be including residents. Master planning, again, in a review, should be reaching out to residents. We'd love, to, I've said this many times, we'd love to be uh, more included in some of these studies and this information and in the decisions made and asked in advance of the decisions. Um, so thank you. Right, thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. We'll move right forward to the, the presentations. Uh, Roberta, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to try to keep this going out of fairness, particularly to the presenters who are here. Sure. I know that we have time limits, and then we're going to have Q&A from, from council members. So I'll leave it to you and, and Bob to take us through that. Okay. Um, thank thank you. you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, go back um, a little bit uh, to how we structure these studies. Uh, we met with the council. Um, and put some context around this. We met with the council on uh, December 9th, um, and during my manager's report on December 9th, uh, we had just finished, Bob, myself, and Blaze had just finished some preliminary work with various uh, consultants. Um, we were trying to define, because I think um, on September uh, 31st, whatever that date was, there was some confusion as to what some of these studies were. So we did look at four, um, parts of work, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, we looked at uh, municipal infrastructure, which is kind of defined as water, sewer, police, fire. Um, we looked at fiscal impact, we looked at a comprehensive traffic uh, study, and we also looked at education. Importantly, uh, and I want to emphasize this a little bit, uh, we are also asking the consultants to do realistic build-out scenarios, right? So it's not just looking at uh, what it looks like under the new proposed code, but what could be built there under the existing code. Um, so, and is it commercial, is it multi-use, whatever, but we've asked them to address this issue of um, building out, uh, doing a build out of uh, current code as well as the proposed. Um, the process that we uh, went through, we. Uh, Got some input from uh, Susan, we got some input from Gwen, we went out to eight providers, we spent some time with, I guess, Rutgers, um, and got some recommendations. Um, the general consensus at that point was depending on who did what, it was a two to four month kind of effort. And we said on, uh, at that meeting on December 9th that between then and somewhere between January 6th and 13th, uh, we would have, um, the proposals and the, the contractors come to speak with the council and uh, present to the public. Um, at that point, I also provided a couple of perspectives that we had garnered over the couple of weeks that we were uh, working on this. First, um, fiscal impact. I think it's, uh, it's clear that a revenue analysis was not done uh, during the planning board process, nor was it a part of the planning board process. Um, and again, from a fiscal impact revenue analysis perspective, we've asked the consultants to come back um, with uh, thoughts around what it would look like under current zoning versus new zoning. Um, on the education uh, side, we know that um, fiscal impact has two components to it. One of it is revenue, the other is cost. One of the, could be, one of the significant costs is education, as well as the municipal infrastructure. I've said then, and I still uh, continue to say that I think traffic is the most complex of the four analyses um, that studies that we're doing. Um, and we have to really determine, you'll, you'll hear a couple of different angles on um, how we're gonna do, how we can do the comprehensive traffic analysis. Um, we, again, will look at that based on multiple build-out options. The, uh, we asked the consultants, and I said this on December 9th as well, to assume that the parking deck is in place um, and is operational. Uh, the, um, on December 9th, I also announced that we did have uh, results of Mazer's parking study, so that was back on December 9th. And I also said, I believe, 
um, <clears throat> Maddie come later, that we were asking Mazur to do a couple more intersections, which they will do, and I think I said at the last meeting that they can't do that until actually uh, when the holiday season is over, it just would not, would not make sense. Um, I said at that meeting, and I said in a subsequent email to the council, we have not put North Walnut in the mix at the moment um, because that's kind of maybe in the distant future. Um, so I think the reaction of the council that night was pretty positive. Um, Paul um, added um, that he would like us to do this on a special night. I think that's crucial. Um, we've been having meetings 2.30 in the morning. Hard to get the business, I mean, we have no business to do in the village. It's hard to get that done at two o'clock, uh, two o'clock in the morning. Um, I think, uh, so we outlined what I would call the parameters, the scope, the breadth, um, and I would say that um, Bob and I and Blaze um, interviewed, spent time with each of these consultants. I think we met probably with them twice and we might have had some telephone conversations. We are bringing you credible consultants. Right? They're all similar to when we did the parking deck. Um, these are, are credible uh, consultants. The way the structure of this meeting is, um, because of the competitive nature of the meeting, we have the uh, consultants um, in the cafeteria. Um, so each one cannot hear uh, the previous ones and have some kind of advantage by hearing the discussion between the council and us and uh, the earlier consultants. So they're all uh, in the other room. Uh, Janet is acting as what? Oh, yes, he's the first one. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can stay. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's a piece of And um, uh, so we will do that one at a time. Uh, they will leave after they've presented and after there's been, a, you know, a conversation with the council. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions about the format. Bob, do you want to add anything? Uh, just briefly, uh, each firm has been assigned a time limit depending on the number of studies that they'll be making a presentation on. Uh, three of the firms will have 20 minutes, which will consist of 10 minute presentation, 10 minute Q&A by council. Um, the large one, the last one will have 30 minutes, 20 presentation, 10. And the uh, first one, um, who I will introduce is uh, from Hire Gruel at Hire. Uh, you'll have 25 minutes, uh, 15 minutes on the, your presentation. 10 on Q&A. Heather will be responsible for giving you a two-minute warning in both cases, and we'd ask that we try to stick to that, um, that timetable. So with that being said, if there's any other questions. Okay. Go ahead. Please. Up here, please. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome. Great. Yeah. Okay, you want to put your stuff here if you can. So are these different than the ones that we provided the council with earlier this week or? Uh, that's supplemental material. Okay, all right. Why don't I give these to the council first? You can take the microphone out also okay. if it's easier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Uh, I'm Fred Heyer. I'm a principal in the firm of Heyer Gruel and Associates. We are community planning consultants. The portion of the job that we are bidding on includes the fiscal and the school district analysis. Our firm is a community planning consulting firm. We are a pure planning firm. Uh, by that I mean we do not do architecture, engineer, or traffic work. Uh, our, our firm's practice is principally municipal. At the present time, we represent on the order of 50 municipalities throughout the state of New Jersey uh, in a variety of capacities. Our firm does a great deal of work in virtually every area of planning, including comprehensive planning and zoning, redevelopment, urban design, uh, and uh, rural and farmland preservation. We do a great deal of redevelopment work as well, and in the redevelopment field, there is an awful lot of fiscal 
analysis that goes on as part of that discipline. Uh, personally, uh, we are also adjunct professors at the Graduate School of Planning at Rutgers University. I've been a professor and practice there for about 15 years. Uh, I've taught comprehensive planning and planning studios. The planning studios are classes where we take the students out for a real world, real job experience. Uh, so we've done just about every, every facet of planning. Uh, we are particularly concerned about the uh, impact assessment and what, what uh, community altering factors that development can have on municipalities. A lot of municipal land use decision making is fiscally driven uh, because of our reliance on the property tax. It's very important to New Jersey municipalities to look at those things. Um, one of the aspects that towns are always concerned about is the number of public school children generated. And there are standard methodology, methodologies that are used to assess those impacts. We are very careful about looking at those because most of those are boilerplate uh, pro formers that are done where you fill in the blanks and you have various uh, templates that you use. There are things called per capita multiplier methodologies and proportionate valuation methodologies. And I think where our strength is, we have the ability to drive down deeper and see in each of those methodologies the inherent flaws in the underlying assumptions. Those methodologies all assume certain things. And if you're given the assumptions, you can control the outcome. Uh, we've been involved in doing a lot of these studies ourselves. We've also been involved to a larger degree in evaluating studies that have been prepared on behalf of applicants as part of their work. Um, again, we've done these studies not only to inform uh, uh, school investment choices, but uh, in terms of redevelopment for payments in lieu of taxes to figure out whether the business deal makes sense for a municipality. We've done these studies recently for communities uh, in, from Gloucester County up to Sussex County. Our municipal clients range from towns with 400 people to uh, the city of Newark. So we've got a, a broad range of, of experience in dealing with projects at a different scale and at different scales in evaluating their impact upon communities. I'd really rather focus tonight on the, on the Q&A side of thing. If you give me a chance, I, I'll talk all night long and then I won't have any time left. So if, if, if we can, if you have questions of us, if you've seen our material. Sure, appreciate that. Uh, anyone want to start with questions? Could, could we stop uh, I just want to know, uh, am I adding the time to the presentation? It's 25 in total. Okay, so okay. okay. So Thank you. More time for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just what I wanted to <clears throat> Great. Mr. I have a couple of questions about the financial impact analysis. Um, the, the A question is on the revenue side. The obvious impact is added tax revenue, and I assume that's somewhat adducible from our current tax records for the type of, of uh, construction, the type of use. But what else would constitute revenue from a project uh, as those that are envisioned in the ordinances? Occasionally, municipalities want to assess the, uh, what they call secondary impacts, and that would be, in particular, if you were dealing with uh, mixed use or commercial properties, there might be secondary impact to the, you know, the underlying activity of the community in terms of purchasing power. There could be conceivably employment impacts, either construction employment or permanent jobs. Those kinds of things could factor into the equation. Um, not all revenue is revenue, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. One of the things that we find is, is in the no free lunch the way the world works. Uh, for example, if you do really well and you get a development that produces a lot of tax surplus beyond what the costs are, ultimately sometimes that catches up with you. And the way that catches up with you is sometimes in increased Mount Laurel affordable housing obligations because your employment goes up and that's a factor in allocation. Mm -hmm. Also, what can happen too is if you become uh, in a situation where you have a high valuation per pupil, sometimes the state cuts the age. So sometimes all revenue isn't revenue. Sometimes mm -hmm. revenue is offset by other changes. There, ideally, there's a sweet spot where a project uh, moves ahead and it helps you without necessarily 
triggering those other, those other negative consequences. Those other negative consequences are usually for large scale projects. And then and briefly on the expense side of the ledger, when you look at impact on infrastructure, <clears throat> where do you cross the line to de where you say, well, you need a new, we have to improve your, uh, you know, your, your sewerage system, you have to improve your water utility because that X resident has triggered the requirement. I mean, you, it seems to me to be a very difficult judgment it, to you, make. You've nailed the core of the issue and where the problem is, and that's where the models fail. It, everything depends on local knowledge, and what we're talking is kind of a hybrid approach to do a case study and uh, you know, a standard analysis. What that means is to ask the municipal family where the problems are. You public works, you're, you, you know, you're, uh, you're a police, fire, mm -hmm. school, school in particular uh, is important. For example, in, in some, when, when you say the cost per pupil is this, you take the, the school budget and you have a line item that says the amount to be raised by local taxes. Yeah. You take that number and divide it by the number of school kids. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, that's the number, the cost per student. And, and it's true as a snapshot for what you have now. And I, and I apologize for interrupting you. I, the, the school impact I, I get, I had the privilege of attending the study that was done okay. for the Board of Education. But I'm thinking more of in terms of uh, village infrastructure, such as, you know, you mentioned police, fire, sewer, water utility, uh, and, you know, and, and the like. It, is there some methodology for for determining, well, you're going to have to spend nothing for the first X residents, but X plus one is going to get you to a million dollar expenditure. Yeah, typically what we would do if we're, if we're going to drill down that far is to look at the budgetary categories you have, the various line items, and within each one of those categories of appropriations to examine and interview the people that are in charge, whether it's public safety or public works or those people, say, do you have a problem? Do you have a problem? Uh, municipality-wide or a problem in the particular project area that will be impacted by additional development. S some straws break the camel's back and some of these things you don't see, obviously. Uh, the standard approach is to just take the budget and, do, and lop it up, but you're absolutely right. The, the devil is, when is there an instance where the next person costs you a lot more? And the school one is the easiest one to understand. You either build a, class, uh, build a school or add a classroom or have to hire someone. That, that, that added student costs you more than the students that you have already. The, the, other, the other aspects, if you want to look at that, again, they involve interview, interviewing public safety, interviewing public works, and the various other line items to determine whether there are any project specific or municipality wide thresholds that may be crossed. Okay. Yeah, and Albert, I would just Thank you. I would just say that we when uh, higher group uh, gave us a, a proposal, we did they did not include the infrastructure piece. So they're not one of the firms that okay. has really fair, bid fair on point. that right. piece. Yeah. So I just want to point yep. that out. It's a good answer anyhow. But <laughs> actually, but you're talking about the financial right. side of the, not Correct. capacity, but the financial. Yeah, not exactly. The yeah. Because yeah. In added infrastructure, whether it means more pipes or, or, or not, it means more dollars it's or not. It's the dollar side yeah. of the equation, yeah. Great. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Mike. Um, I'd had a, I just had a question about the, um, the school's impact studies. Is it a um, standard model, model that you use, and then do you localize that to uh, the particular school district that you're looking at? It, it's absolute, it absolutely has to be localized, and if it's not, it's just boilerplate, and you might as, throw, as well throw it away, because there are some surprising things that happen. Uh, you know, the, what we found, for example, with, with multifamily housing and rental housing in particular, there's an inverse relationship between rent and school-aged children. The lower the rent, the more the school-aged children rather than the other way around. In, in some municipalities, just because um, the housing is small, it doesn't mean you have a relatively low number of uh, public school-aged children. In towns with relatively modest amounts of multifamily housing, you tend to have more kids even in units that you wouldn't think would have children. And there's a secondary impact that happens with, uh, with schools, particularly in, in desirable towns where people want to stay in town and sell their house. What happens is you have a family that's been an empty nester living in a single family four bedroom house that says, I finally found a place downtown that I can move without leaving town. 
their home becomes a, another source of additional school-aged children because they've been empty nesters for 10, 15 years and that home hasn't produced a year. So by them moving but staying in town, it opens up, it opens up the ability to you know, repopulate the house. That's it's another thing that happens. And again, different schools, uh, everyone, everyone uses the Rutgers, uh, who lives in New Jersey. David Listikin teaches in the same department that we're in. Uh, we've worked with David and with Dr. Bruchel on, on a number of, of matters. The danger in, in those multipliers is, especially with respect to uh, the multipliers that deal with transit-oriented development, the multipliers are extraordinarily low like less than one child per 15 or 20 units. The sample size is very small. The number of developments that they actually looked at to produce, a, and David will tell you that, the sample size is small, so you have to really look at the individual case in the municipality, so that's important. You may have, placing the same unit here may have a different consequence than if you place that unit somewhere in uh, suburban Somerset County, because it would be a whole different market. Thank you. Just before we go on, uh, Heather, how much time do we have left? 13 minutes. 13 minutes, okay. <laughs> Susan, Gwen? Oh, actually, um, so just in terms of the um, school age, the repopulation of those empty nester homes, if they were to relocate into these units, so are you looking at the demographics of the community at large to ascertain what necessarily what numbers of those individuals might shift over to apartment dwellers and leave, to, is there like a percentage, some, something that you'll work with on that? that? That's hard to get a handle on, and again, it, it's really a function of the desirability of the town. Uh, and it has to be a town, it has to be a project where an existing homeowner would be willing to, to live. And a lot of times, that's not rental. It tends to be higher end, for sale, housing, you know, fully appointed, slightly larger units, but still multifamily. So you can get a, you can get a rough estimate on that, but you're not going to get you can you, to a few percentages. You may be able to predict. Do you have anything else, Susan? Um, no, not just yet. Go ahead, Gwen. Sorry. Gwen, do you have anything? Sure. Um, trying to see how this new microphone works. Thank you for coming. And I guess I have a couple questions. Um, how many municipalities um, hire outside consultants when they already have in-house in planners? Is that common or is that uncommon? Actually, we have quite a bit, few municipalities that we work for and we do all of their work. So we do everything for them, you know, from soup to nuts, including evaluating the fiscal consequences of proposals. In other municipalities, it's not uncommon to, especially when something is big or controversial or significant, to get a second look from an outsider. And, and uh, we do that frequently in redevelopment. We do it frequently in, in fiscal and housing issues as well, where you know you, you need if the decisions are so significant that you do want a second set of eyes, uh, uh, even as just as a second opinion. Thank you. And. Um then I guess my, my next question would be when they are significant issues and there are controversial issues and things like that that tend to divide the communities, so we go for a second set of eyes. If, if you differ from the planner, then you have a new issue, which is who do we believe, the in-house or the outhouse? And then the, uh, the other one is, if, if, but if you do agree with the planner, I suppose then a lot of times you just have that confirmation peace of mind that. And, and, and much of the time it isn't black and white. It's you are assuming it's X and it's really X plus five. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not a completely different animal. It's, a, it's something within an order of magnitude. But uh, what I think you're doing here is you're looking for consultants that are not what I'll call general practitioners. You're looking with, for someone that has a more narrow expertise than your current staff, which is, you know, you go to your GP or your internist and he'll tell you, you know, there's something wrong with you here, but then you go to the, you know, the specialist there to have it looked at. So it, it's, it's not an uncommon thing. It's a good example, thank you. Um, so do you find it, 
oftentimes people don't believe the studies because of what you said in the beginning, that a lot of it has to do with assumptions um, that somebody has to provide you with the material that is the, the source of your de deduction. And then if they don't, if someone disagrees with your results, they will fault your assumptions. Yeah, if the, if the assumptions are flawed, the whole analysis is flawed. And frankly, if someone is critical and our analysis is flawed because our assumption is wrong, we're wrong. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's that simple. And that's why we're saying you need the, the on-the-ground local knowledge about what the issues are. And then, you know, through the adversarial process, it's almost like when we were involved in litigation court proceedings, you have to assume you're going to be deposed. You have to assume you're going to hear every question. And if you hear a question that you didn't anticipate, you have to answer it honestly. And, you know, out of the controversy, you probably do better work because everyone is questioning everything. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't have a problem with it. It's just that in my short experience in, uh, in this field, I find that there's always half the population that will not, they will refute the results of, a, of, a, of an outside consultant or an inside consultant. There, are, there will be a group of people that will refute any conclusion because it's not the one they want. That's not valid criticism. If someone comes up to me and says, you're wrong because you missed this. We have this apartment complex and the experience there where we have three kids per unit and you didn't even consider that. Well, that's a valid criticism. And if they just say, you're wrong because I don't like your numbers, well, that's not valid. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, I guess as, as Roberta suggested early on, obviously when you do, let's say, fiscal impact, uh, you're gonna look both in absolute and relative terms. You're gonna look at the absolute impact, perhaps, of these proposed apartment uh, multifamily housing units, but you're also going to look at as Potential of right. Potential secondary impacts, yes. Right. How do, you, how do you narrow sort of the as of right? Because there's a lot of potential uses for mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these spaces. How do, you, how, do, how do you sort of go back? Because you can't do it, I assume, for all of the possible uses of a given piece of property. Um, <coughs> actually, one of the biggest things that I, and I've just gone through the file quickly of what's going on, there's a big difference in range of unit sizes and unit types and tenure, ownership versus rental, and the absolute rent, because the impact varies with the type of unit, with the size of unit, with the number of bedrooms, and in particular, and renter versus owner, and with rental housing, again, the lower the price, the higher the multipliers. So you, maybe, um, you know, a project could produce a range of results. Maybe we're looking from, you know, all small, low, uh, you know, all small rental units to a lower number of for sale units on the same property. But what actually, and I appreciate that, but what I was asking for is not just looking at, you know, apartment units right. perhaps in different types of apartment units, but one of the one of the properties might be able to be used for commercial space now. They might be used for a bank or how do you, how do you decide sort of what you're going to sort of compare it and sort of analyze? Um, what, what you would look at is you have to have a an as of right assessment of the property. And that may even mean doing a sketch and saying, and, and, and here are the assumptions, that the, the, that the developer is going to max out, that he's going to build to its full potential, and that he may or may not opt to do a commercial option, particularly on the ground floor. And you can, you can, we can generate from our urban design people pretty good estimates as to how many square foot could be yielded. It doesn't necessarily mean that if your zoning has options that they're going to take one or the other. So what we need to learn from you as part of this process is, and, and we'll show you what can and can't be done under the proposed zoning. And then you have to determine which options you want to evaluate. If you don't like some of them, you may want to take them off the table. And my other question is, and if you, if you can think of an example and be willing to share it with us, an example of a study you've done, let's say a fiscal impact study, that went wrong. That at the end of the day, after you're looking back a year later or two years later after whatever was developed, it was wrong, and you went back and realized this is why we got it wrong. Have, is there any, anything you can share with us in that regard? Or? Yeah, the, the one thing that's always dangerous, and we did this for school districts, and this was very early in my practice, 
Uh, assuming <laughs> that the past is a predictor of the future, when you try to do a best fit curve with a straight line, you know, 1929, you know, you know, you would have predicted that the stock market would have continued to grow. So, um, if you're looking at broad predictions about where your district is going and using the past trend as a as a predictor, that's always a dangerous game. It always has to be tempered. At least from what I'm re uh, I've been reading, you are a relatively stable, slightly declining school district, which is a lot easier to predict. The last job that I did, the school district had lost 40% of its population and they hadn't closed the school. <coughs> it was a district with nine or 10,000 students and it, they hadn't closed the school yet. So the next project, you know, they, and they were, in that particular case, the issue was it was going to be a redevelopment project and they were doing a payment in lieu of taxes. When you do a payment in lieu of taxes, you don't necessarily have to share municipal revenue with the school district. And that was a hot one. That was a very controversial, in-your-face uh, kind of uh, meeting. And it really came down to saying, listen, the only, you have no way of ethically cutting the school district out of this equation. You have to give them at least their proportionate share. And that's how that job finished up. But again, if there's a, if, if there's a danger, it's assuming the past is, is a predictor. You have to look at, at trends. And you have to have your ear to the ground locally to figure out what the local knowledge and the local trends are. For example, in, in one town, uh, the, the schools were, there was an affordable housing project and it was producing a fairly high number of public school kids. And it seemed really unusual. But it was, was and it was a town where there were a lot of divorces and the school district was good. And one of the partners would stay with the kids in the district but downsized in the house and then the other partner would sell the big house and there'd be another family that moved in. That was, that, that, and suddenly the school district was, was growing in the town that was declining. It happened very quickly. So it, it's that kind of thing. Great. And I, Heather, I think sorry. the build out options is kind of, it's kind of an interesting question in all fairness to Fred. We've really been dealing with uh, Susan, his other partner right. on this entire project and she could not, she could have made, she could not make tonight. So uh, sure. Fred is, is here tonight. Um, but what we have done, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, but what, we, what we have done is talked in detail with Blaze, and I think that I think this is true, and I'll say it in front of you, of all the consultants. The, the whole issue of what build out options we look at under current code is going to have to be an exercise between the village, i.e. Blaze, and each of the consultants. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of ways they're yeah. looking at sure. this. Sure. Sure. Makes sense. And, and it's ranges. So to the extent it's ranges, sometimes you get broad ranges depending on what you look sure. at. So. Okay. And, and what you. we would suggest is a range from fiscally what would be the worst to fiscally what, what would, would be, be the best. best. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. I guess we have time for one more question or... See? Oh no, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah I just, I'm just going back to that, that school study, uh, the school impact. So when you're looking at that, every school district has its um, unique attributes and ours in particular, we have a, a range and a, a likely a high population of special education students, which impacts that fiscal piece yep, of it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just interested in, in knowing, do you take that as an evaluation as to what percentage, if you have a certain number of increased students, are you looking at those percentages and how there, they There are a way of accepting out the extraordinary costs, and this way, you know, those special needs, the high dollar special needs, aren't reflected in the higher per capita. Okay. We had one municipality that had 400 people in it. The whole town is 400 people. There was a trailer park in town that produced two special need children. The tuition for these two children nearly bankrupted the community because they had a municipal budget of $100,000. It's those kinds of extraordinary things that happen, but that, that's not really part of this. That's, um, those, we should just assume the average case for the most part, unless there's something about the project that would produce a disproportionate number of special needs students. Uh, I live in a district that has a really high, <laughs> high percentage of special needs students. And what happens is, as the district gets a reputation for being a good district, it's a magnet for others. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You do a good job and more people come in. That's right. Great. Well, thank you very thank you. much. Really Thanks, appreciate Fred. the appreciate presentation. It. Thank you. <laughs> Two tasks, so That's the first. Yeah. <laughs> You're nice. Nice teacher. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. I have a card. Yeah, it's fine. Take care. Good night. Safe travel. Good night, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Jeez. Are you fighting with each other? Right. <laughs> uh, Janet is getting the next uh, okay. presenter. So, so I think what I'll do is I'll ring the bell two minutes and then ring the bell time. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have you come up here. Yeah, so Rick. We're, Rick, we're doing the kind of up here, so. Okay. So, okay. Dylan, I think they have a um, presentation. Yeah. Anything you want to say to introduce? I will. Okay. The microphone. <laughs> Next, we have uh, representing Mazer for traffic impact uh, is Rick Roseberry. Uh, Rick, you'll have, once we get started, you'll have. 20 minutes, 10 for presentation, 10 for Q&A. Heather will give you a two-minute warning for both of them. So we'll just wait till everything gets set up. What I'll do, just so you're aware, I'm going to ring a bell at a two-minute warning and then ring the bell again in time. <laughs> Good evening, and the, the floor is yours. You're going to have to use the microphone there, Rick. Yeah, you can pull the microphone out of there, too. You can just throw that one anywhere. I think that was Heather's microphone. He didn't like the 20 minutes. Yeah, he didn't like We're not even a half hour into it. Yeah, it's disconnected already. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh, just by introduction, uh, Rick Roseberry with Mazer Consulting, and a uh, little bit about myself. I'm a principal associate with the firm, uh, professional engineer, uh, certifications in numerous states. I'm also a AICP certified planner, uh, certified public works manager. I work both in our civil site group and our municipal group. I represent uh, five municipalities in New Jersey as our township engineer. Uh, with me here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jeffrey Fiori. I'm also with Major Risk Consulting. I'm an associate with the firm. Uh, I manage the transportation planning group. Uh, I am a licensed engineer in New Jersey as well as several other states. i uh, member of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Uh, I've been before probably 200 boards uh, throughout New Jersey, testifying both on a private and a public end. Uh, and I'm currently the uh, city traffic engineer for the planning board and uh, zoning board for the city of Trenton. And we're happy to be here tonight. I'd like to go over our scope of work um, that was in our uh, proposal. Uh, there's several steps that are uh, that we anticipate uh, taking with, with uh, this, this work. Uh, the first is the data collection and distribution analysis. And what this is, is we're proposing to first collect data uh, for one week. Uh, so we get all the peak hours and variations of track mile throughout the, the village. And what we're doing, if you look at this exhibit, um, you wanna fast forward to the, the area? If you look at this, we've picked out eight points that are uh, highlighted in, uh, 
as on this exhibit, uh, letters A through H in, in blue circles. And basically, the, this is the extents of the village. So by taking, and what we do is we put ATR tubes, which are automated traffic recorders, which are the, those rubber hoses that you typically see on a roadway that you drive over. Mm -hmm. And what that would do is we would count all these roadways for a period of one week to establish not only uh, the peak times of traffic uh, coming in and out of the, of the village, but it will also enable us to look at a whole week. So we're not just capturing a snapshot that you typically do for one a normal traffic study where you just look at a morning peak and an afternoon peak. We're looking at an entire week's worth to cap capture the ebbs and flows of traffic uh, in and out of the village. Yeah, this is really a step-by-step -step process that we're proposing here. Uh, that week's long effort is going to tell us you know, how many vehicles are coming into the village, how many people build, vehicles are going out of the village, and when they're occurring. The second step to this, which would go, would occur pretty much at the same time, is looking at the proposed zoning of, of the four sites and coming up with a trip generation model, determine how many vehicles are going to be generated by these uh, with the proposed zoning, and then we can take that information and we can uh, determine how many vehicles are going to go into uh, each direction by using that distribution analysis. Uh, by knowing how many vehicles are going to go through the intersection, we're going to be able to define the study area better. Uh, we initially sh showed, back here, on this plan, uh, the intersections that are in red are all potential intersections that could be impacted uh, by the uh, future residential developments. Uh, we don't anticipate that we're going to have to study all these intersections. What we would do is we would look at the tri trip distribution and the trip generation models, and we would see how many of these intersections are going to be impacted by uh, 100 vehicles uh, per, per hour. That's the DOT and IT standard uh, for having an impact. We may find that a lot of these intersections will not be impacted by the proposals. They would not be included uh, in the next portion of the study, which is step three. Uh, once we define the study area, then that's when we would go out and actually conduct manual turning movement counts at the uh, identified intersections. So step one is kind of come up with a distribution. Step two is identifying how much traffic is going to be generated. And step three is where we distribute that traffic based on, on the data that we have obtained. Uh, then you go to step four and identify capacity. Uh, capacity, uh, what we do is we uh, count the peak conditions and generate the peak hour traffic volumes by uh, the selected developments. And what that does is identify when capacity is, is at its least on the roadway. So in other words, you're at, anal analyzing worst case uh, conditions. And we propose to do that throughout all the intersections within the uh, scope of study. So when we complete step four, we actually have the basic of the whole traffic study. We know what the proposed zoning would have, what impact it would have on the, the village and the intersections. Uh, we then have several optional items in our proposal. Uh, step five is analyzing different uses on the site. And that's where you know, I would step in and work with your village planner. We would uh, look at what could be built there under current zoning and other alternatives. You know, we're gonna do mixed use, commercial, uh, whatever we determine, we can look at that, we can do new trip generations, we can do new trip distributions, and then we have a comparative study. Uh, that would be step five, and then you have something to look at and compare to. Uh, step six is traffic mitigation. What if we do all this work and we find out that there is an impact to an intersection or multiple intersections? You're going to want to know, what, is it retiming? Is it a new signal? Is it additional lanes? And that's step six. We'll look at the intersections that do have a uh, negative impact uh, by level of service, and we'll uh, come up with some recommendations to you to let you know what the impact would be. And then finally, step seven is we've included meetings with the village council, uh, and this occurs throughout this entire process. We'll let you know early on what the findings are with the ATR counters. We'll discuss what our refined scope of study area would be, what intersections we feel would be impacted. You know, we recommend 100 peak trips, as uh, we mentioned with the ITE and DOT. You may find that you want to 
we do so. You may want to analyze intersections that are impacted by 50 trips. You know, that's something that we'll discuss throughout the process. So throughout the process, uh, we will include numerous meetings with the village council to keep you informed of what's going on. And uh, what we anticipate as far as meetings go is we anticipate, we've set this up step by step, and after each step, it represents a milestone where we'd come in, maybe with professionals, maybe council, and discuss our findings and how we plan to proceed. Um, that's pretty much our presentation. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that council has at this time. So Great. I would just add, sure. um, um, in discussing this with the team here and all the traffic consultants, we have raised the possibility of taking the 100 to 50, and we'll have to work through that to see if it makes sense. Um, so I think we agree. And the other thing I don't think you covered, uh, but Mazur did in fact do the um, analysis of the deck, and that analysis will be folded in uh, to this one, including the enlarged work that we're doing in the next couple of weeks. So yeah. I just wanted to just add that. Yeah, and this traffic study is completely independent. We're not looking at any prior traffic studies except for the ones that we did. Uh, for the garage. We're not going to use anybody else's traffic numbers. Everything would be generated from scratch. And you also were, Mazur was also the traffic consultant for the planning board during this process. Yes. Yeah. Just, just um, excuse me. So, uh, let, just before we start with the questions, uh, how much time do we have, Heather? Well, they didn't take all their time, so they have um, 12 minutes and 49 seconds. Yeah, all 40 right. Minutes. Let's, let's go then. So, just real quick, could, Roberta. Um, you know what, Albert and I couldn't hear what you said with the 150. Could you just repeat that, or 100 or 50? You said something, and we just couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, and I was saying, and they could explain this better because they're the, the experts. But um, right now, we're using new. We're thinking about using New Jersey DOT standards, which means if you have 100 at peak, 100 cars going through, we will go to the next district, the next uh, intersection. There's an argument to be made for looking at 50. And, and maybe it's different at different intersections, but we, we would have to work that out with any consultant that we hire for a, for a traffic study. Just trying to establish a standard. Thank you, Roberta. Great. Sorry. Okay. Is that okay? So, you, yep. I'm okay. sorry. Questions. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, first, my, my thank you. Your report is very thorough, um, your paperwork is very thorough. So, just the first question when I'm hearing you and you're talking about traffic mitigation. Has there ever been a circumstance where you have said, this simply can't work here, this is too much development for this particular intersection, immediate area? Has there ever been a, a situation that you've been in? Uh, yes, there has. Okay. And uh, there's a lot of different variables that factor into that. It could be environmental, it could be capacity of the intersection, it could be right away constraints where an intersection, you, you just can't fit any more lanes, you can't play around the simple timing. It, it just becomes, uh, it's impossible to, to uh, you know, make any mitigation. Okay. And then the other, um, when I was looking at the intersections and I see that uh, we have um, Broad and Hudson. Now that's the, specifically the location of the proposed garage and we're going under the assumption that the garage is built. However, that's very close to, as you know, I'm, you're familiar with the Dayton project. And how do you factor that in if you're assuming something is built already? How do you work those numbers? Because just by virtue of adding 300 vehicles from a garage, potentially, and then adding other development factors. Well, what, what we would do is, and we do this in, in any traffic study, is we work with, with the consultants of the town. And what we do is we establish our, our base conditions which is we take our volumes and, and grow it by a background growth rate. And typically, DOT publishes a, a 1% to 2% annual growth rate, depending on the county and depending on the, uh, the type of roadway. Uh, from there, we would consult with your town professionals on what um, adjacent developments have been approved but not yet constructed. So we factor that traffic into the analysis as though it was already constructed on the roadway. So the, the, those developments that may have been approved but are still under construction would be accounted for within the analysis. Okay. Okay. I'm good for the moment. I have a question about the um, studies look at unit density, and I'm specifically residential unit density, which is an issue that has been brought to this council as uh, a concern of our citizenry. I, obviously, it would be easy for me to say we wouldn't need a consultant. More density means more traffic, but is that true? Uh, I hate to give the typical trap, trap answer, but it, it depends. Um, 
it depends on the proximity of the you know, development to the, to the train station. Uh, nowadays, especially with millennials, they're not looking to have a car. They're, they're looking for the public transit to get, get jump on the train and get right to the, the city. Um, so more density not necessarily um, look, relates to more traffic. Yeah. It may generate more off-peak traffic, but when we're looking at the peaks, uh, oftentimes, especially uh, given the location uh, mm -hmm. to the train station, uh, you saw, see a lot of people choosing mass transit versus using a car. And I, I should have said, because the issue was framed not in terms of people density, but unit density. Uh, and again, the, the syllogism would be more units, more, more traffic. But if you have a certain building envelope and you have a choice to put 35 units in that or 25 units in that, how, how do you see that working into the, how does that impact the traffic study? I'm talking about apartment units. Well, we look at the bedroom mix mm -hmm. when, when we do this. And we could also work on a kind of a sensitivity analysis. Work on a what? Do like a sensitivity test where mm -hmm. is it if, see how it does a 20, 25 units per acre versus 35 units per acre and kind of see where that breaking point is if there's a breaking point to be reached. Okay, and then this last thing, it's not a question, I apologize to my colleagues, it's more of a comment. On your pricing formula, it's very much an a la carte menu with lots of, if you do this number of studies, you pay $2,400, but if you do more intersections, you pay $2,000, and then it's $15,000 if you look at alternative uses, and then I'm doing this from memory, if there's, it's $5,000 to report, et cetera. So it's quite a smorgasbord, and I can't really, unless I knew now exactly what you were gonna do, price that. Is, is a fixed price something that's out of the question? If, yes. if you Yes, and, and that's the reason. The whole reason we proposed it this way is because mm -hmm. at this time we can't tell you how many these intersections would be impacted, and that's where the standard that I mentioned of 100 vehicle trips peak hour being impacted by each right. intersection is important. Now we'll know that after phase one of the project, mm -hmm. once we complete the perimeter uh, analysis and the initial trip generations, we'll know how many of these uh, intersections will be impacted. Uh, until we do that, it's not <coughs> Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate your candid and response. Be what? And I think that could be better established as we have these milestone meetings with mm -hmm. the town and the professionals. Uh, after steps one and two, once we have the distribution and trip generation, we'll be able to determine how many intersections are impacted and we need to, to analyze. Mm -hmm. And at that time would be the time where we could give you uh, the better price okay. or more accurate price. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Gwen? Hi, thank you. Um, for being here and answering our questions. I was wondering, um, nobody's even thought yet to ask, it have, has the timeline been given to you that there's a deadline for the studies to be done or do you have, do you have a timeline you anticipate? We were told at the end of February. Okay, great, thanks. Yes. That's it, thank you. Great, Mike? Thank you. Um, I had, um, I guess, two questions. You, you, you've done a lot of work I guess currently in the over the few, past few years in the village, um, does, do you feel that gives you um, sort of a heads up? Do you have sort of an idea maybe w what you're getting into? Because I know some of them were, I, I guess, a little more narrowly focused and they weren't as comprehensive as, as this proposal. So does that give you any kind of uh, sort of like a heads up, like you come in maybe knowing a little bit more than somebody who was just starting uh, to look at this at, well, at the we, village? we have, um, as was indicated, we have the planning board traffic engineer House. But we're taking, uh, we tend to use them as a resource, but it, it's our intention to look at this as kind of separating ourselves and doing it as, as an independent analysis. So we will incorporate the data that, that's been presented to the planning board uh, for the adjacent developments that we have to incorporate it, but this is kind of us taking a fresh look at it, you know, from an independent standpoint. Thank you. And um, how would this, uh, is, is, would it be, this be useful for um, uh, future planning? to have the, the, the downtown area impacted, and maybe could you explain a little bit like how that could play into um, putting together a comprehensive master plan for a, a vision or a direction that we'd like to see the, uh, the downtown head in? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, it certainly can. Uh, we could focus that, uh, we're gonna look to your planning professionals on what build year they want us to look at. Do they want us to look at a two year build out, a five year build out, a 10 year build out? Uh, and that's where that, where that growth factor that I spoke to before comes into play. Uh, based on that analysis, we would gen look, project the traffic for, for that build year. So we, you know, maybe look at uh, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, uh, to see what intersections are still operating okay. Maybe there's a time between five and 10 years that 
uh, an intersection starts to uh, develop issues and we can establish that. And uh, we're also gonna be able to tell you which developments are gonna trigger which improvements, <coughs> if any, at, at certain intersections. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this just popped in my head. Is there something that, uh, if you're looking at an intersection and you're projecting out 10 years, like how would you determine that it's, it's okay now, it's kind of okay halfway through and then it gets bad? Like, is it um, population growth, is it? Uh, basically, it's the growth of the traffic, and, and it's based on the, the, uh, the volume of the traffic, uh, your lane geometry, and the ability to process traffic through each intersection. Thank you. Great. And uh, I just have one comment. Uh, again, it's more of a comment than it is a question, but one of the things that struck me about your presentation is under optional, you put analyze different uses of the sites. And to me, that would seem to be a key piece of this puzzle because we don't want to just look at, let's say, the apartment proposals in absolute terms. We want to sort of look as of right and so I have a sense of because it's going to be very subjective you know if we do this these are the concerns we have if we do that these are the concerns we have or opportunities I should consider. Yeah, that's a great point because uh, that's something we thought of um, because if you change the, the use you can change the distribution of traffic you can change the amount of traffic you can tra change the directional flow of traffic which whereas you know if it's residential you may have a heavy outbound in the morning and a heavy inbound in the PM. If it goes to office, that gets reversed. Right. So that, that, that's what we were anticipating in those and, and John Jard did some of that with the planning board. He sort of created this chart, actually, which we have up on our website, which showed different uses and what, the, what we could right. expect. So that I, would, the only, my, I guess my only comment is that wouldn't be an optional item. That would be something we would probably require. Sure. Great. Any other questions? Do we have time? Yeah, still? I actually do have a couple more okay. questions. Sorry. I don't know if this is. Oh. See if to turn that How much time do we have? Okay. I'm sorry, Heather. Uh, three minutes. Okay. okay. So I just wanted to talk about the peak hours, the time, the peak times that you're doing your studies, because I know there's automatic counts and manual counts. So, are you taking into account, like, the, you know, certain areas are um, have unique characteristics? For instance, one of the big issues that came up most recently is the church um, scenario where. The church is very active at, on Saturday at 7 p.m. between, uh, or actually between 5.30 to maybe 7.30 or 8.30 on a Saturday evening. And that's also between 7.30 is the big restaurant rush, which we all are familiar with. So is that factored into your peak counts, or is that something that you considered? That, that's actually going to be uh, counted when we do the, the first counts with the uh, automatic traffic recorders, because they're down, they, those recorders are down for seven days. They're going to be counting 24 7. So that'll identify any ebbs and flows of traffic uh, through, throughout the village. So on, on those automatic, though, they're identified on certain locations. So yeah, yeah, so if you look up at, at this exhibit, they're, they're all the blue circles. They're really, uh, labeled A through H. We, got, we kind of selected these locations because they represent the extents of the village. So I thought it would give us a whole good holistic. Right. Okay, so I would have to just take a look at this over the next couple of days and better understand where those go into. Okay, sure. appreciate it. Thank you. And then I would say that there is some flexibility on where these are placed. Uh, we just felt that based on what we were looking at from a study area, those represented kind of like the, the outskirts of the, of, the, of the village area okay. and would help us better identify uh, how much traffic is coming in and out. And then one more, just one last question. Now, I see on Franklin Avenue and Walnut, you have um, identified as one of your intersections. Now, we also have that listed as a North Walnut redevelopment zone, and although it's not listed in here necessarily, would those traffic counts be factored into what potentially might be built there? Or that's not even, that's not in this mix at all? Right now, we're anticipating the four sites that are proposed for rezoning and the parking garage as being the used for the study analysis. So if, if that had to be factored into this, because it is something that is in a plan, it's a North Walnut redevelopment plan, and there are opportunities for development there in the foreseeable future. So logically, that would we would want to include that into this. Yeah, that, would, that, that would increase the study area. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree, though, and I think that's what Roberto was pointing out earlier. I mean, we have really no idea. We started talking, I don't know how familiar you are with this on our redevelopment zone, but having a, uh, uh, assisted living home put there, we, we haven't discussed that. So 
I, I think, I mean, there's multiple uses that they could look at that, you know, that site, and to me, that doesn't make sense to necessarily include that. Well, and, and the only reason I raise it is because it is something that was discussed at September 30th, and I, although the other item is, I'm just going to finish my, my thought, although it's on the back burner, I don't know, we don't know what the, um, where that's going at this point, but there are other, are other options for build out there, whether it's in the form of uh, retail with uh, 12 units per acre density. So there are other options. Maybe it'll be just be garage. Maybe that's something that we need to include, but that's another conversation maybe yeah. for tomorrow. Okay. okay. Well, I appreciate the invitation. It's good seeing everybody again. Great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Watch your step. Oh. Yeah, just watch your step. Take another microphone. We're trying. Right. <laughs> okay. Do you want to um, start introducing the next one? That bell is so pleasant sounding. Who's next? Um, wait, can I look at the list? The next firm we have is Ross Haber. Ross Haber being presented. Uh, Ross, you have, he was, he'll be making his presentation on education impact. You'll have 20 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for presentation, 10 minutes for Q&A. Heather will identify when you have a two minute warning for both. Heather's our clerk right down here. Uh, I'll ring a bell at the two minute and then ring a bell at time. And I'm just going to ask that you watch your step because there's wires. This is like a real bell. It's not like to flip the bait. Thanks, Ross. Give me a half a second until the shows sure. up. Should I include, who do I turn my back? You're addressing the council right here. Oh, Good evening. That's us. Good evening. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> I didn't find the year. Oh, excuse me. I didn't find the year. January 12th? better we need an official's time out here. Yeah. We didn't start Stop the clock. <laughs> no, you're not stopping. You have five minutes. <laughs> the clock is running.
You know, I can start um, and just, uh, it'll have that up in a minute. Anyway, my name is Ross Haber. The name of my company is Ross Haber and Associates. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit about my, I'm, I'm here to talk about the education component, the potential impact on the public schools. Um, as you guys may or may not know, um, I just recently completed a study for the Ridgewood Public Schools. I did an enrollment projection for them now. That study was, um, it was narrow focus because it was really focused on the ability of the school district to utilize current classrooms and current structures to go from a half day to a full day kindergarten. I didn't get into any of the financial, I didn't get into any other, other kinds of implications for that study. My understanding here is the purpose of this is to expand it. So if you'll give me my first slide, I just wanted to give you a second to tell you a little bit about myself. Okay, first, you know, I wrote, I did this and I realized I put everything in the first person. You know, like a football player says, you know, Tom Jones ran out of nowhere. But sorry about that. Okay, but anyway, um, I've been providing demographic redistricting, facilitation, and transportation studies to school districts in New Jersey since 1995. I've worked with well over 100 New Jersey school districts as well as school districts outside of the state. Um, my own background is not necessarily that as a statistician. My own background is really, I was a teacher. I was a high school principal and a, and a, a school district administrator. I did some uh, college teaching at Montclair State University uh, when it was still Montclair State College. Um, and I hold a doctorate in educational administration from Columbia University. So I don't come to any of these things strictly as a statistician. I come more as an educator, understanding schools and all the things around schools. Uh, my areas of expertise include projecting enrollments um, by incorporating uh, historical school enrollments and doing enrollment projections on that, looking at the impact of new housing on, on schools, uh, how that um, uh, how that will affect budget, how that may affect tax levies, how it may affect transportation, uh, and it may even cause, in some cases, a need for redistricting. I'm not saying any of that applies here. I'm just saying these are my areas of expertise. Next one. Okay, so here's my understanding of the scope of the project. It's uh, the component that you're looking at me to, to deal with. It's to provide the village of Bridgewood with information regarding the impact of proposed new developments on school enrollment. This impact would include, but not necessarily be limited to, long-range enrollment projections district-wide. The impact on schools within those zones that these new in which these new developments are located. I understand these are having different locations. They may have different impacts on different, on different schools. I understand maybe two of the schools will be most impacted by these potential developments. Um, this would include, uh, when we look at this impact, it would include things like classroom utilization, uh, how it would affect the number of classrooms available, uh, the class sizes, what the impact might be on class size, would it increase class sizes, you know, depending again on the number of students that come in, uh, and how would it impact support programs. Along with curricular, there are special education programs, physical education programs, a number of things like that. This study would be expanded from what I did in Ridgewood to take a look at the impact, the budgetary impact, uh, based upon what these projections would do. Would these projections, would these new students in any way, shape, or form affect the budget, okay? Would it require the, inquiry, the hiring of new staff? Might the expansion include construction at the schools um, uh, if, the, if, if needed? Um, what about things like safe crossing streets, where these things are located? How do kids walk to school? Would you need additional crossing guards? Um, and the possible, the possible need for change in remote, uh, for change in attendance zones if any school gets particularly overcrowded. This is not to say any of these things are gonna happen. This is to say these things could happen. And that's why you're having this study done. Next slide, please. Okay. okay, so what kind of data would I be looking at? Okay, in terms of, in terms of doing this, what would I need to complete my component of the study? Well, I need, I need the most current um, enrollment from the Ridgewood Public Schools. Now, I do have that data as of the early fall from those schools from the previous study that I did, but I might like just to upgrade that data from the school district. Um, I don't see any problem getting that data from them. Um, I need to know the specific locations, although I did look at the plan 
but what the specific locations of where these developments are or what kind of housing deal will come from them to determine impact on the individual schools. Important to know the type of units, the square footage, the number of rooms, the type of apartments, to determine which are capable of producing school-age children and which you know, are not. Um, the number of, if, if there are age-restricted units going in, I need to know the number of those because they would be deducted. Uh, they would obviously not generate children. Um, and also the number of affordable units, uh, whatever your obligation is. Now I know that this is all litigation now and no one really knows, but I think I've discussed that we could take a really good educated guess and come up with a high, low, and medium range projection based upon what we believe the number of affordable units would be. You know, just on, on the chance that we won't know before the end of this study is done. If we know it, great. If not, we can come up with some good estimates. I need to look at the current school budget, look at revenue and expenses uh, to see how they line up and how they might be impacted by these projections. I would need to know the current tax levy. And then I want the other thing I'd want to know is the student yields from existing housing units, which are similar to those that are being proposed. Yeah. Now, you know there's something called the Rutgers University study. All right, the problem with the Rutgers University study, in some cases it really works, in some cases, because communities vary and what they get out of apartments are different, it's good to look at comps. It's good to look at what currently exists in this community and maybe some similar communities around compare those to the Rutgers study and come up with some kind of reasonable compromise between the two. Uh, next, please. Okay. Now, real quick, just real quick so you understand, a very quick look at my, uh, at my methodology. This is called a cohort projection. And all this is, is it follows groups of students as they move grade to grade and comes up with a multiplier that comes up with a multiplier that tells you what the projected number is going to be. So if a five-year average of kids moving from first grade to second grade comes up to 1.04, you multiply this, the current year's first grade, to come up with the next year's second grade, and then that carries through. To this, I distribute, I come up with the number of students per grade that, come, that will be coming out of the new housing, and I project them, I take a look at them over the period of time we expect them to come in and add that to this study to come up with the totals. And I'll project that out to do each of the individual schools. Next slide, please. I'll then at, apply this to a utilization, a utilization table, which tells me how the projections are going to affect class size, room utilization, numbers of kids per grade over that five year period. So for example, coming from the study I just did from Ridgewood Schools, if you look at Hawes Elementary School, and this would be an estimate with a full day kindergarten. I just did this as a sample. You would see that we would need three sections across the board, except for fourth grade, which would need four sections, and shows the average class size, and they do that for each year. And that tells me, with the total number of rooms in the building, how many I need for general education, how many I need for, for special education, and how many rooms there are for other purposes. Last one? That was two minutes. Two more? Okay, good. We're on, we're on track. Okay, last one. And this is the last one. And I'll go slow. Use up my full tube now. And then what I do is I then show the total allocation of rooms in the school building so that we understand exactly what programs can be accommodated, how many classrooms we need, and can we accommodate every program that exists in the building. And we did this, uh, we did this uh, at, again for the Ridgewood Public Schools to determine if it was feasible in terms of room utilization to go to a full day program. The answer was yes. Now that did not include what the cost would be, didn't include what um, the waivers that are needed for bathrooms from, from, the, from the county superintendent from the state. It didn't include cost of teaching staff. That is another set of issues. And by the way, that's what we incorporated into this study. You can ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I'm certainly now open for questions. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Okay. We'll start down here, we'll start with Mike this time. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering, um, in, in your studies, what kind of a difference is there between uh, a more desirable school district and a less desirable school district as it pertains to drawing children into a, uh, into a town through various new developments? Well, um, there are numbers of ways of looking, uh, of looking at the differences between you know, good, better, better, best, and poor school districts. Of course, one is performance of kids. 
you know, you can do a comparative analysis of, of various test scores and various performance parameters, that's one. Another one, a very important one, um, is class size. Um, I'm a very strong believer in good class sizes. Good class size isn't 14 kids in a class, a good size class size isn't 28 kids in a class, but in your 19, 20, 21, 22 range, I think that's ideal, and I think a lot of people in assessing the value of a school district will look at the average class size. As you start to go up, um, it isn't always necessarily the case, but performance can be measured against class size, so that's another parameter. Um, then there's variety of programs. Uh, what, what do the school districts offer um, on the secondary level, on primary level? Um, so, um, and even something as simple as what do your buildings look like? Do you want to put your kids in a nice environment? Now, I had the good fortune of touring all of these school buildings. These school buildings look great in this district. And so it's an inviting area. And of course, the corollary to all of that is that a good school district enhances property values, enhances desirability of people to come into a community. So, I hope I answered the question. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Haber. Um, I guess I have a couple questions. So when you were talking about the data uh, that you use, that you, the, the variables that you plug in to come up with your initial um, matrix, or the, the subsequent matrix, um, it's the number of anticipated kids, you said, it's not the same as the Rutgers study. You, you, you do comparables with other towns to kind of gauge what you think, but also based on the, um, the uh, ordinances and the potential um, for the size, are you going to look at um, the different densities? Would you do it at this density or that density? Because, you know, we're trying to decide on what density. When you, you mean like different types of housing sense? for? You mean like? For, for, for the anticipated new multifamily housing it, at 35 units an acre. You know, then there's other variables, like it depends on, as you said, the price of the units, the size of the units, um, and things like that, so. Well, one of the things that the Rutgers study does give that's, that isn't necessarily the yield factor, but they let you look at the different parameters, uh, median, the median above, median below. In other words, a, um, just a, a condominium with a, a three bedroom or three to five bedroom condominium with a median value of five hundred thousand dollars or greater, produces x number produces um, x number of students different than a two to three bedroom condominium with five hundred thousand uh, median value of five hundred thousand dollars or lower. Now, I could take that, which is a very good guide, uh, especially if we take a look at what the relative home values are here in Ridgewood, but not necessarily use their statistic. Apply the Ridgewood statistic. So, for example, let's say Rutgers says that um, a, a, a condo, a two bedroom condo at $500,000 or greater can be expected to produce 0.37 elementary school kids. But let's say I look at that comp in this town and the reality is it's producing 0.75. Well, I could use the value parameter, but use the yield factor based upon what this community actually does. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a balance. It's, it's, uh, it's a regression towards the mean, in other, it's, it's yeah. trying to strike that balance. I, I think that's what everyone is looking for, that's what people want, have, have wanted, is something individually more pertinent to our community. But the, the other question I have is, since the buildings aren't built yet, you don't know if they're gonna cost $3,500 a month in rentals or $4,500 a month. And the previous uh, consultant mentioned that price points affect the number of school kids. The less expensive the dwellings, the units, the more school children it tends to attract, as opposed to if it's a luxury uh, condo, it tends to have fewer school children. Is, is there any truth to the it, price points? I think price, you know, how can I, okay. If you've got a $3 million home, okay, is it significantly different than a $1.5 million home in terms of the type of people that move in, okay? So what I'm so I'm, so so I think that when you're dealing when you're dealing when you're talking about the difference between a thirty-five hundred dollar month and a forty-five hundred dollar month, you're probably not dealing with a significant difference in student yield. Mm -hmm. On the other side, when you're dealing with lower income, okay, then you could expect a fifteen hundred dollar month two bedroom apartment is going to probably have a slightly higher yield than a four thousand dollar two bedroom apartment. But the yield numbers are very very close. It's not the difference between one kids and two kids. It's generally the difference between 0.75 kids and 0.85 kids. 
And again, I, I'm, I'm, don't quote me on those numbers because I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about in terms of reality. But that's what I need to find out in terms of looking at this particular community. Thank you, yeah, I, I, I found that helpful. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, I just want to ask a question. It's kind of, I, I hope it's germane. Um, our school population, as you've certainly uh, d determined from your work so far, has gone up and down in the past. Um, in the 70s, we had 350 more kids per class in each, uh, in each class than we have today. You know, the population, uh, the school age population in the 70s was, you know, 1,000 more kids at the high school, um, if you count the three grades with 350 more kids per grade. So, at, but, but I guess that doesn't matter. Your point is you're just going to say that if there is an increase, an anticipated increase, uh, this is how it would affect the budget. Uh, let me ask, ask, interpret what you're saying in a slightly different way, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, if there were a thousand kids in a particular building in 1975, and that building hasn't changed, and there are 700 kids in that building today, why would there be difficulty accommodating those? Well, uh, I use an example of something I call, well, this sounds very slick, I love it, um, that I use something called the incredibly shrinking school, okay? And what that simply means is that you could have a building of 20 classrooms built in 1965 with 20 kids per class, it accommodates 400 kids. Now you've got 300 kids in that building and you've still got 20 classrooms, how about you don't? Because you have two special needs sections of six kids each which require an 850 square foot building. You've got to accommodate 12 resource room kids in another. So now your 20 room classroom is a 17 room classroom. But let's go a step further. We've got speech, we've got OTPT, we've got all of those kinds of things that encroach. So even though your numbers go down, okay, your, your, your numbers of kids go down, your need for space increases. So a lot of those questions get answered like that, that I don't believe that a moderate increase in enrollment has a greater impact on a school than a decrease over a period of years just because of the changes. As I walked into, you know, I, I told you I was a high school principal for many years and I knew a lot about hiding classrooms, you know, because I knew that people wanted to take them away from me. I walk and I speak, so when I speak to the principals, I say, hey, okay guys, what are you hiding? Believe me, in this district, no one's hiding anything. The space is truly at a premium and they're doing some really very cool things to accommodate the programs. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Albert. Mr. Haber, I had the privilege of hearing your presentation to the Board of Education and I must say for the benefit of anybody else who was not there, it was very concise and it was very informative. I, I noted that what you not only presented the data, but as you presented them, you made observations about the construction, the, the structures themselves. You noted, for example, that in whether we could accommodate uh, high, uh, kindergarten children or not, perhaps we could look at the computer labs, which are somewhat of a dinosaur or anachronism in 2016. And anyway, I just want to point that out because you didn't say that about yourself, but I, I was impressed when I heard your report that you had actually, your study included walking the buildings and observing what was physically there. As, and so anyway, I make, I make that on your behalf because you, you didn't Thank say you that. <laughs> Quite welcome. But I have a question about, two minutes, two minutes. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go, I don't, I don't want to, just very quickly, unit density is an issue before us. And I want to make sure that, that this syllogism isn't true, because if it is, then we don't need you. If, the, if I do 30 units per acre, right, versus 20 units per acre, the, the latter, the 20 units per acre, will have one-third less impact on the school system. Is that true? Depending on the units. Mm -hmm. It depends on the units. Um, if, you've got, uh, if you've got 30 units with five bedrooms and a reasonably, uh, reasonable cost, yes, it'll, it'll impact, much, impact much greater with the same number of units with 30. But if you've got a variety of units, mm -hmm. that's the determination. What does the variety of units mean? So it's not density so much as what, as, as make what up. the structures are. Well, thank you. I don't want you know, to give the answer, but anyway, I just wanted to make sure that that, that would be included in your consideration. Great. Susan? So um, just two things, and I just wondered in, in terms of the space and the schools being at a premium and the, oh, I'm sorry, the, the same space today, 1975 space versus today's space, is it possible just even the course offerings are so significantly greater? There's just a, a lot, so many more course offerings that require different classroom scenarios, so. Well, on the high school level, absolutely. Yeah, I just. Okay, uh, I mean, I don't know how many, how many 
uh, schools were from Mandarin, Mandarin in 1970. Right, exactly. Okay. So just in, in just one of your notes, you said you anticipate working with other consultants in different study areas and how it affects the, your study areas specifically. Could you just elaborate on that? It's, I, 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 I want, okay, it's oh, so I just, I noticed. Yeah. I just, in your, you said that you anticipate working with other consultants in other st study areas to determine the impact on your particular area of study. Could you just elaborate on that? Yeah, that one, um, yeah one, of the, um, one of the things that's really, really I'd like to know, uh, I think that the persons like, for example, this is a traffic study, okay? Um, I think they would like to know what the impact is of school children on traffic with regard to safe crossing streets, special needs transportation, so sharing data between the, the uh, between the, the, the consultants is important. I'd like to speak to the people who are dealing with the real estate or the construction component of that to really get a lowdown on what the what the apartments or what the what these residential units are going to look like. How many designed is transit? How many designed the kids? That kind of thing. And, and so presumably, I'm I'm sorry. I know Heather rang that bell, right? But presumably, if you have uh, an apartment um, being occupied by a family with two children in a necessarily transit-oriented community you would be generate then vehicles that they would in fact then generate traffic by virtue of their well they could they could generate they could generate uh, again I, i'm not an expert in traffic but right. but something like does a crossing guard impact traffic do you need crossing guards right. with these kinds of things so these are the exactly. kinds of questions that got it. we would share got it thank you great okay. thank you so much ross really appreciate it okay that's us yes. well, thank you all. thank you just be careful with all these. Yeah, watch out for the wires, please. And, and, uh, on behalf of the people. And the yeah. edge is quick. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I think they took his time. Okay. Thank you, Russ. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much again. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. I don't want to trip over the wire. No problem. No, no, the Are we taking a break or something? Oh, does she have water? Can you bring two back? No, I don't think so. Thank you. No, thanks. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Look, throw it in my head. It's just a mild concussion. This is better than we get at I know, it's cold. Oh my gosh. Hi, Gordon. How are you? Okay. Um, 
So our next uh, presenter is from the RBA group, Board Meff. Um, he is presenting um, traffic as well, only traffic. Not just yeah. So you're on. I guess you have your uh, presentation up, right? Correct. Just to just go over the rules, you have uh, 20 minutes, 10 minutes presentation, 10 minutes for Q and A. Heather will ring a bell when you have a two-minute warning on both. Okay. Uh, should you finish earlier in your presentation, we'll just add it on for the Q and A. How do you want me to face? Right here, Council. Okay. Hey there. Thank you. <laughs> and you can take the microphone off. That's easier for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it might be fine here. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, what I will tell you is that in preparation for tonight, I looked at the traffic studies conducted so far in the downtown and for the park and garage, and really taken a look from an independent eye about what the situation is right now. And I've looked at uh, your proposed amendments to the master plan. Um, will my clicker reach? There it is. Okay. So first of all, we have up here the, the downtown area. I guess this is a little awkward for the council. I'm sorry. Um, with uh, basically a few signalized intersections and uh, you know just the street system. So first and foremost, you have a proposed parking garage. 412 spaces, I believe, and part of that would be reversing the direction of Hudson Street and Passaic Street. I know there's also discussion about some intersection improvements in the area. <coughs> Add to that the four zones that would be, that are under consideration for residential development. I took a look at what the yield would be based on their size and came up with about 100 units for these two up in this area, 90 units down here, 60 units in this area. Superimpose that with these intersections that have been studied through various, through about four different traffic studies to date. The two Maples, Maple and Ridgewood and Maple and Franklin, the um, Broad and Ridgewood intersection, um, and as part of the parking garage, oh, what happened? Mm -hmm. oh, Dylan. I lost. Dylan. Dylan. Yeah, let's wait. We should get on the TV. He's coming. He comes. He's coming. Hope is on the way. Back to the rescue. Just lost audio visual. <laughs> There you go. Okay, we're back. Back. Oh. All right. That was a magic touch. <laughs> so you, in, as part of the parking garage study, two intersections here, Hudson Street at, at Broad and Prospect. Now, if you look at what, where the areas for redevelopment are proposed. Ooh, we have an we seem to have an infrastructure. Mike, something? No. <laughs> no. My computer. Try punching it. It works on my computer. Yeah. Oh, no. This was a good one. Time to regroup. Okay. Well, given audio technical difficulties, uh, I'll go off memory. The bottom line with all of those, there's about five different intersections that probably ought to be looked at. Okay. Really, in particular, what hasn't been looked at. Okay, here we are. Thank you. If you look at up in this area where you have 100 units potential, no, there's been no looking at Broad Street and uh, Franklin. Chestnut and Franklin, and Oak Street and Franklin. Now these are signalized intersections, and part of the challenge of those is the fact that they're basically traffic stacks and blocks traffic operations in this area. So you, you really have to, you can only, to understand Chestnut Street, you, you really have to understand what's going on at these two intersections. In addition, Chestnut and, oh, here we go again. <laughs> the rest will be from memory, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, Chestnut and Franklin is, um, or, 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 I'm sorry, okay. We, we have an intersection over on this side that uh, is, is potentially an issue as well when I've talked to staff. We, we have Chestnut and, and Prospect and Ridgewood. This intersection with its strange geometry really can be a potential trouble area especially when you superimpose the traffic circulation from the parking garage and the changes to it. So with, with that in a nutshell, some of the issues to really address when you study them. First and foremost, a lot of the properties that we're talking about could be developed under current zoning. So you can't really look at what's there today as a baseline. So you really have to compare it against its highest and best use on current zoning to, make it, to decide what the impact of a change in zoning would be. That's first and foremost. 
Second, half of potentially uh, impacted intersections haven't really been studied so far from what I can tell. Third, baseline traffic volumes that you've got in the current studies, some of them are up to five years old at this point, the data that was collected. That's kind of old for traffic data. The next one, <laughs> the next bullet point will be that Saturdays haven't really been looked at, okay? Only one study looked at Saturdays. And from that study, we, we were able to find that Saturdays are actually have higher traffic than weekdays in this area, in the downtown. The uh, intersections have all been studied individually, too. But no one, from what I can tell, there's been no analysis of how one intersection impacts each other with respect to queuing and uh, blockage and just how they interact with each other. When you have a lot of traffic signals that are pre-timed in a downtown, they can affect the traffic flow up and down the road. Pedestrian circulation and safety is a key issue. If you look at a lot of these traffic lights, the technology is what I like to describe as antiquated. There is um, a lack of pedestrian signal heads. You know, there really aren't any. The latest practice is put countdowns in, and um, the visibility of the signals themselves is not always ideal. Um, transit use is another key factor. Given the, the demographics of this area, you could expect in the Census Journey Works uh, survey uh, supports this, a lot of people to be coming to and from the train and not necessarily driving. So that really has to be considered for residential. And parking demand specific to Ridgewood. Residential site improvement standards are a standard within the state, but they might be too high in this circumstance, which means that you may have to overbuild parking. That isn't necessarily good for a community. It encourages people to drive more and have more cars than anything else. So you can, uh, you know, sometimes limiting parking supply can help reduce traffic impacts. I think that. So getting into why us, first of all, um, I would be the lead in this. Uh, I've got 25 years experience in traffic engineering, 15 in front of boards, been accepted to four 62 municipalities, served as traffic consultant for boards of 16 municipalities. I did review Valley Hospital, spent a lot of time in this building. I'm <laughs> sad to say the HVAC system's not any better. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, so basically, that's, uh, those are my qualifications in a nutshell. I have certifications that were obtained through examination and experience as a professional traffic operations engineer and professional transportation planner, in addition to all that experience. And uh, I'm supported by a team of over 20 traffic engineers, transportation planners, and uh, technicians. We also use video count technology for, um, traffic data collection. Uh, we work almost entirely for the public sector. Our firm does not do much private sector work. We don't have a lot of conflicts of interest. We have specialists and nationally recognized specialists in bicycles and pedestrians <coughs> on our staff. Uh, and our relevant experiences, um, several communities, including in, in this area, Englewood and Ramsey, so in this county. Um, getting back, I've worked on several major large development projects, including Goldman Sachs in Jersey City, uh, reviewing the Jets headquarters in Forum Park, Honeywell redevelopment in Morris Township, Bear redevelopment in Hanover, Valley Hospital, as some of you know, and other large projects. So, in a nutshell, those are the qualifications, these are the issues, and why I think the traffic study should be done. I know that in terms of timeline, four to five weeks is what it would take to get a traffic study done. We, and part of it is we would, all the intersections we want to look at, we'll use video technology to do it all at the same time. That lets us look at the videotape, see what's really happening, and tells us more than just the raw numbers. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, Gordon. We'll start with questions. We'll start down here. Okay. Let's take a bow. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so um, first I, I just wanted to ask, oh, it's so loud. Uh, the traffic studies that you indicated are, in some instances, four to five years old. Why is that problematic? If you could just elaborate on that. The normal rule of thumb for traffic numbers is, um, or for traffic studies and data collection, is you really don't want to use studies that are older than three years unless you're doing it for a specific purpose, like trying to benchmark to see how things changed. It's, 
the traffic patterns change. Um, you know, economies change. I mean, actually, in 2011, we were still probably in the midst of the recession, so I'd be worried those volumes might be a little low compared to what came later. So, you know, the, the, but the bottom line is patterns can change over time. They don't always. But three years is a, a generally in, is sort of an industry standard accepted practice of appropriate age of data to use. Okay. My other question is, on your note, you had an... Um a line that indicated there were discrepancies in counts used for a valley, is that? I found a very large difference in volume, which I think really needs to, I, I think needs to be one of the reasons why one would need, need new counts. On um, Ridgewood Avenue, there, as part of the valley study, there were several intersection studies, including um, Van Dien and, and uh, Ridgewood. And from that tr count in the PM peak hour, Somewhere between that intersection and Maple, at least three or four hundred cars disappeared, which is unusual because there's not a major street in between. So looking at it, I, I, it leads me to believe that one of those counts may have been bad. I don't know which. There's nothing worse than having two bad samples. It's like a, you know, it's like when two people when you have two people watch us. You don't know what time it is. You need a third. Okay. So um, I, also, I wanted to know is the video system of counting, if I understood you correctly, is that better than the automatic system? Do I have the terms right? I think it was an automatic system and manual counts, and then you said video counts. Is there well, some? What happens is there's two ways of counting, okay? The, the, the old conventional way. One of them would be tubes on the road. Okay? Right, exactly. Now the thing about that, it only tells you how many vehicles go up and down a road at one moment in time. Most analysis has to happen at the intersection where you have movements and turns. That's critical. Until probably about seven or eight years ago, the, the state of the practice is to sit there and count them by hand. Okay? You hit buttons on a machine and it tabulates it. So a human observer does it. The video technology we use, we basically put a fisheye lens up, and we did these counts as verification counts at Ballot Hospital, too, when we did that review study. Mm -hmm. We basically put this fisheye lens up, it gives us a picture of the whole camera, and video or imaging technology counts those cars, determines who went left, right, and center. The important thing is two things, twofold. Number one, you get an audit trail. You get to look at the video to see what happened and be able to verify that the count is accurate instead of what one person in the field may have seen a given day. Second, we usually then count a couple of days instead of just one in case some, we found out later that something unusual happened that day, like there was an accident on on Garden State Parkway and not half of people didn't make it there. Got it. You know, that's that's one of the reasons we use that so we can collect a lot of data without having to put people in the field and drive up costs. Okay, we mount the equipment, we set them up to record, we come back, pick them up later. And really that helps us cut costs and do it more cost effectively. But more importantly, it's always good to be able to see traffic at several locations at the same time, point in time, in case you get a daily discrepancy. And that way you have, you kind of see if traffic is backing up between locations or not. Okay. I, I, I'm done with it anyway, so you can probably just leave it. So okay. I just had one last quick question, because I know we just have a certain amount of time here. The, um, I actually had a note to self, pedestrian circulation and safety. So it's, you, you said that, and so I um, wondered, that's integrated into your study, is that pedestrian circulation and safety? Part, part of the video technology is we count bicycles and pedestrians at the same time. Okay. Second of all, we would, we would look at walking routes, sidewalk completeness. We would look at the ability to cross the street in conflicts with certain movements and turns, you know, the high friction locations, and look for options to minimize potential risk factors. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Mr. Smith, thank you very much for the obvious preparation that you put into preparing your proposal. Uh, two very quick questions. One is in respect of uh, your statement that the current, the status quo is not a good baseline, and I agree with that completely. We all know that any development where there is no development is going to bring more traffic. Uh, but will you be giving us uh, comparisons of the alternative uses and the resulting traffic that would result from the alternatives? I would be looking site. for guidance from your planner to determine mm -hmm. what the development potential scenarios would be. I understand that all these developments may not be entirely residential anyway. There would mm -hmm. be commercial right. components and mixed uses. Proposed. So right off the get-go, I can see we can compare two or three scenarios, okay? And one scenario maybe being current zoning, what could you go there? Another scenario would be 
all residential. Another scenario could be a mixture of residential and commercial, mm -hmm. okay, and even sub scenarios, just to find out and compare basically the specifics of what is impacted where, and if necessary, how could it be mitigated? <coughs> right. Yeah. And the, the, if, it's and, if there's a mitigation, how mm -hmm. should the cost for that be divvied up in accordance with all applicable laws and guidance? Okay, and among the sub-scenarios might be varying densities if you assume the residential component could have 30 per acre or 20 per acre, whatever. Uh, and then uh, my last question is in respect of the timing of traffic lights. It seems to me that uh, very often I'll sit at a traffic light on a busy street where we're stopped and no nothing is happening on the cross street. And I always say, well, do the times have to be equal? It would seem the obvious answer is no. Uh, is, is that something you would... You, would, you could incorporate in your report to us you know, some suggested timing of our main intersections? Yes, well, I can tell you my own observations are everything runs on a 90 second dial. Many of your signals are um, electromechanical controllers, which aren't really used much anymore at all. They're reliable, they're good, they're relatively cheap, but there's no detection, there's no, like the normal practice would be, first of all, in a downtown, 90 seconds may not seem like long, but it's a minute and a half. But if you're sitting in a side street waiting to cross, that's the kind of thing that makes people walk into traffic and give up on the light and waiting for it to be safe or to cross. Because it just takes too long. I mean, really an appropriate cycle length in a downtown should be more like 60 to 75 seconds, yeah. all right? Because you gotta cycle in quick. You, because the problem is, with 90 seconds, you get 40 cycles an hour, right? If you do 60 seconds, you get 60 cycles an hour. So the same traffic doesn't back up nearly as far. Mm -hmm. It's the waiting, that's the, that's the trick. The other thing is that, yes, you could use detection technology, the down for vehicles, it's good at night, but, you know, so you don't have to sit and stop at, at lights. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just a personal that's example, that's whenever I try to get out of uh, Prudential Center after a hockey game, I have to go through all these pre-timed signals and just sit and wait to happen. <laughs> but but the, the truth of the matter is, there's a trade-off. Because the, if you actuate for vehicles, it becomes less friendly for pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that people have to push a button and wait for a whole cycle to go by before yeah, it's safe to get across the street. Yeah. Yeah. So the trade-off sometimes is in the middle of the busy day on Saturdays and weekdays, you operate your pedestrians coming up all the time but at night, you basically rest on the main road mm -hmm. and only actually for people that pull up on the side yeah. street. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your, you know, your thoughtful and extensive answer. Great, Gwen. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm, I, didn't, oops, I didn't see any um, uh, literature in the emails that we got from the council. So I, I'm just here, are we all just hearing your presentation with no backup? Or was there backup material? Anyway, uh, so I, I might be asking a stupid question because um, I don't have the RBA one. But um, I, I was wondering, did you say that you're gonna, you would propose to start with five intersections? No. No. What I said is there have been five intersections in your downtown study so far. There's five more that really ought to be looked at. I would actually look at all ten at once and start fresh. The other thing is there's only two that have been looked at on Saturdays. So we would look at it Saturday as well, as well That's as right. the other yeah. hours. Mm -hmm. So the key is, I mean, I guess what I was trying to emphasize with that first chart, and I apologize for the um, audio visuals, um, I guess I had to have a little VGA uh, adapter to use the projector, and that's probably what caused the problem. Um, I'm gonna have to pay a little bit more next time for a better one. Uh, the, uh, the, but the key is this. There were, you've only had really half the intersections that ought to be looked at, looked at so far, or have been looked at so far. And of those, some of them haven't really been studied since 2011 volumes. And to me, those really should be redone and looked at again. I mean, some of them were done last year, but not all. Okay, so, but I guess I was thinking, so the price that's reflected here, it, it includes reviewing the old ones and adding five, or basically redoing the old five and adding five? It would, it would mean doing 10 intersections. Okay, thank it you. It doing 10 intersections on a Saturday and we record for multiple weekdays, but yeah. pick one to, to process. Thanks. So we have the video as backup if we get any questions. Sorry. That's okay, we get two minutes. Oh, that's two minutes. Yeah, okay. two minute warning.
there's more people who have asked questions. I better give you guys a chance. Um, yeah, just, just real quick, throughout the, the course of your studies, if you found that you needed to um, add intersections or change something up, would you be, be able to do that um, if, if it became necessary? And yes. I mean, there's, there's obviously different ways that could come about. When I study it and look at the numbers, I may find there's something we missed, in which case I'll probably usually find a way in my current budget to deal with it. And then there's questions that come up after the fact, and then I can probably do a per intersection price and look at them. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't have any questions, so, so if wow. anyone else. <coughs> Actually, I did. Um, sorry. Okay. So in, to um, Councilman Seedon's point, adding intersections, because I had noticed on your list of intersections, and I'm, I'm hoping that it's not, those are not necessarily the limitations, because um, one of the big issues that came up most recently is the addition of a parking garage, and you made your uh, point about garages. Um, however, the intersections of Broad and Hudson, Broad and, uh, I'm sorry, Hudson and Prospect, Passaic and Broad aren't listed anywhere, and I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with those issues and whether those were in your scope of study. I didn't list them because really that's related to the parking garage as opposed to these developments, and the counts for them are still more or less new. They're 2015 counts, they're from last year. So I didn't include them in the counting. Um, I could if necessary. I also know that, I, I believe, the, at least the, your parking study recommended further study, particularly with regard to changing the direction of the streets and the intersections. I assume that intersection, that, pro, that process was gonna go on in parallel and that I shouldn't replicate effort. And actually, because when, when we decided and voted on uh, taking this approach, part of the overall comprehensive study was to include the parking garage and another site at North Walnut. So that's why I'm asking. I think perhaps, um, because I loved your presentation, perhaps we just need to refine the, the uh, scope of study on, on, in, in your uh, presentation. I think the, okay. the, the other two, I'm off. Uh, the other two intersect, intersections we're talking about are the ones that are getting studied this month with, with another. Uh, the parking garage. So yeah. I just want to point that out. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Thank Watch you your step.
taking maybe a short break. <laughs> Next group is uh, our next group is BFJ planning. Uh, we have three representatives who will go through and introduce themselves. Um, you have 30 minutes to make your presentation, 20 minutes for presentation, 10 minutes for Q and A. Uh, Heather, our village clerk, will ring a bell when you have a two-minute warning in each one. Um, and if you do not use the 20 minutes, we'll add that to Q and A. So you have a half hour in total. Um, BFJ is presenting on four impact studies. Uh, and I'll ask that you address the council when you make your presentations, mm -hmm. and um, it's all yours. Great. Well, yeah. thank you very much for having take us. Um, and, and right? you can take the you microphone out. That's easier. Careful. I should uh, yeah. sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Don't worry about us. Um, as, as we said, we are BFJ Planning. We are a multidisciplinary consulting firm, and we are here to present uh, for all four uh, impact studies. So just who we are, I'm Susan Pavati, uh, principal with BFJ Planning. I have just about 10 years of experience with the firm. Uh, I have worked all over the tri-state area, doing a lot of zoning work, a lot of comprehensive planning work. I'm also a New Jersey resident. I live down the road in Chatham, and I'm chair of my planning board there. Good evening, uh, my name is George uh, Jacques Mach. I'm uh, the principal at BFJ Planning for Transportation. That's my expertise, traffic engineering, parking, traffic impact studies, transit studies, and so on. And my role for this study will be do, to do the traffic study or to uh, manage the traffic study for this undertaking. I have over 40 years of experience. I'm a professional engineer. I'm licensed as a professional engineer in traffic engineering in the state of California. Not that California is relevant to this, but it's the only state that licenses traffic engineers in their own specialty. Tina. Thank you. I'm Tina Lund. I'm a principal with Urbanomics. Um, we are an affiliate of BFJ Planning, and we do economic development, socioeconomic, demographic forecasting. And um, since we're giving years, I am now 19 years and 28 days of experience with Urbanomics. <laughs> Just wanted to give you a little bit of a background on our firm. You may or may not be familiar with us. Uh, we have been around for about 35 years. Uh, we have about 15 people on staff. Uh, we do share office space with Urbanomics. Uh, in fact, they're moving up to our floor tomorrow, which we're very happy about. Um, and we have really five areas that we focus on, which you see here. Um, general planning, comprehensive planning, zoning work. Uh, we have several urban designers on staff who can do sketches and um, you know, renderings and comparative uh, analysis, that type of thing. We do a lot of environmental work, uh, and we do some real estate consulting work, uh, market analyses, often in conjunction with urbanomics. And finally, as George mentioned, we do a lot of transportation planning. And, we often do uh, plans and studies that take several or all of these uh, areas of expertise into account. And just a little more about ergonomics. As I mentioned before, we, were found, uh, we are affiliates of BFJ. They own us partially, but we are still a 51% uh, owned women's business enterprise. Um, we were founded in 1984, and our range of, range of services includes forecasting and modeling, um, economic development, market and financial feasibility, fiscal analysis, and impact assessments, um, several of which will come into play for the studies that we require. And just to give you some um, examples of work that we've done that we think is relevant to this project, um, we have worked all over, as I said, the Tri-State area. We've worked in a lot of um, villages that are of a comparable scale to you, particularly in Westchester County, um, some really nice areas, and, and Southern Connecticut as well. What we are trying to show here is not necessarily places that are like you, but studies that, are, that is like the work that, that you're asking for. So the type of analysis that um, we think you're seeking. Um, so a couple of that we're doing right now, uh, out on Long Island in the town of Huntington, uh, they have an area that's called the Melville Employment Center. Many large uh, multinational national corporations are headquartered there. However, they are starting to have some problems with office vacancies and they're looking at ways to make it more competitive, perhaps bring in different types of uses, mixed uses and residential. 
Um, so we are doing a lot of impact analysis to try to give them a sense of what that means for their school district, what it means for traffic, which is a real concern there. Um, so we think it's very comparable, actually. Um, over in Bedford, which is a uh, town in northern Westchester County that has some really beautiful small hamlet areas, I believe Martha Stewart might live in one, um, they're very interested in maintaining their character that they're known for. So they recently had a, uh, a national chain wanting to expand their footprint in, in one of these hamlet areas. And they had some zoning proposed largely to address that. So we were brought in to look at the various impacts if they went ahead and adopted the zoning versus if they did not. Um, something that we're, we're really excited about, um, it's certainly larger scale than, but, than, uh, than Ridgewood, um, is we are working on behalf of several community and uh, civic organizations in New York City to look at Mayor de Blasio's affordable housing initiative, which is, if you've read about it in the news, a very significant um, change, looking at some density, um, really significant increases. And so on behalf of these civic organizations, we are analyzing what that means for these neighborhoods and coming up with some recommendations that we think are fairly constructive um, and which are now being considered by city council. And then the last one, we have worked for uh, more than 20 years in a village called Mamaroneck on Long Island Sound, and we did a transit-oriented study for them that looked at ways to um, activate the area around their train, train station, looking at um, perhaps more residential uses. And really no changes to density, but some other changes to zoning that, that might have an impact on various uh, elements of the village. And so as part of that uh, zoning, which was adopted, we looked at what that meant, again, for the school system, for traffic, for sewer, that was a key issue. So we think that all of these are, are very relevant uh, to what you're asking for. This slide shows some examples of uh, traffic studies that we were involved with. The first one on the upper left is um, for the borough of Madison here in New Jersey, where we were hired by the borough to review traffic studies for their applications. So there we act as the advisor to the borough of Madison. On the top right uh, is the Princeton University Arts and Transit uh, neighborhood study, where that involved a significant zoning change. There we were consultants for the university, doing all the traffic studies and parking studies, and the presentation to the uh, borough the town of Princeton in that case. In the lower left uh, is a traffic study that we did for fairly large development in downtown White Plains, uh, where we looked at 20 intersections, doing a very detailed traffic impact analysis and modeling. On the right side is another project where we also did a very detailed uh, traffic impact analysis using all these software programs, highway capacity programs you know, that are needed to do this kind of analysis for your uh, undertaking here. And then um, before I get into the school multipliers, I just want to say that on several of the previous BFJ projects, um, Urban Islands actually performed the fiscal and economic analyses and demographic portions um, for Melville and Huntington, um, also for White Plains, Westchester Pavilion. So we've uh, been an integral part in the larger planning process, so we're very, very comfortable working together. Um, but as far as the fiscal impacts are concerned um, in Ridgewood, as in every community, um, school impacts generally rise to the top as far as concern is concerned. And uh, what our experience shows on this slide is um, we did do the school demographic study for the redistricting in Jersey City, looking at the expected um, school child generation based on their rezonings, and then working with the school board to rearrange their district lines to um, best distribute children um, in the easiest possible manner among the facilities that already existed. Um, in Portchester, New York, where the number of school children generated by um, redevelopment, especially in their new downtown rezoning, was incredibly contentious. And it was very difficult to get the school board and the village council to even sit at the same table together. Um, we managed to create a school child generation multiplier tool, which was a custom um, cross tabulation of school child generation because Rutgers wasn't working for them no entrusted Rutgers, that we were able to match up with um, school district numbers to create a generation rate that they were happy with, that both sides of the table were happy with. And uh, then we applied that to the hard and soft costs 
of instruction, so cost being <coughs> operational cost per child, and also since they were ex had exceeded capacity in their very quickly growing school district, we also looked at hard costs of construction that would be required to house new school children. Um, more classic school demographic forecasts that we've done have been for uh, Zabarian High School in uh, Brooklyn. It's a Catholic school, um, it's all boys, and they were looking at the potential to go co-ed. And then the Whitby School uh, demographic study in Greenwich, Connecticut, and they were looking at an expansion. So now just to get into what we're actually proposing to do, um, our understanding of what, what you need, and, and we've, we've tried very hard to educate ourselves with all the significant information that's already been done, we think it's a great foundation. There's a lot of good analysis that, that has been done already. Um, but what we are sensing you desire and what you need is, is sort of an independent, fresh look, uh, an objective and comprehensive look at the cumulative impacts of, well, I, I do, um, of these three, um, actual proposed developments as well as the fourth area of the proposed rezoning which we understand was on the table and has been withdrawn but it's still being considered perhaps for a zoning change. Um, so we, we, as I said at the beginning, we're proposing that we can accommodate all four of these study areas. In fact, we often do all four of these study areas as part of any zoning impact study. Uh, we, we would traditionally look at each of these areas. Um, so we, in, in partnership with Urbanomics, feel quite comfortable providing that to you. Um, and giving you that fresh perspective that we think you need to use to make some decisions going forward. So, you know, the start of any of our zoning impacts work is to establish what are the scenarios that we're going to be looking at to try to come up with an apples to apples comparison. What can be done now if the zoning does not change at all? And what would happen if, if the zoning were adopted as proposed? So in looking at the existing zoning, you know, we think this is a really important first step and it's important to get it right. Um, so we would work very closely with, with your um, village staff, including the planner, um, to try to figure out what, what is the reasonable and realistic development picture if nothing changed here. Um, you have, just to go back, you have actually four would be better. Um, you, know, you have four, four areas uh, that are in three different zoning districts. Uh, what is currently allowed? Residential is allowed in some factor in some of these districts. So is it reasonable to expect that that might happen if nothing if nothing has changed? Residential is not allowed in, in the C district as we currently understand it. Um, so really getting that first uh, existing zoning right, um, what might happen is, is very important. So we propose looking at kind of two alternatives within that existing zoning. One would be what if it develops as more of a commercial pattern? If you had more retail, uh, you have a lot of restaurants now, there's clearly a nice niche for that, um, and some office. What if that were, if that were kind of your mix? Um, the other side is what if you had a more mixed use scenario? Looking at uh, is there potential to get residential where it is currently allowed, which it is currently allowed in some areas. Um, and when we're looking at that, we often uh, look at things, what we call soft sites. Um, here you actually have four soft sites that have already been identified, but on those sites, there are some areas that have buildings on them that might not go away if nothing happens. Um, you know, you have a couple of the old auto dealerships, which are somewhat blank slates, but you have uh, the other one, the, the location over here, the Enclave. There's some pretty, from what it looks to us, some pretty successful buildings, a couple on that, on that area. Are they gonna go away if nothing happens? Maybe, maybe not. So it's, it's important to kind of get that first step right so that we have a baseline for comparison. The second step is what would happen under the proposed zoning. You have three actual developer scenarios, so we know what the proposal is for the three sites. On, on the former Ken Smith site, uh, we, we would generate uh, you know, what we expect as a re realistic build out of that site under the proposed zoning based on the site characteristics and, and other factors. So this is really our first step and, and we think it's the foundation for everything that follows. As far as um, fiscal and schools in school impacts, a lot of it will depend on the build out that's developed under the zoning analysis in terms of employees per square foot, um, as well as potential residential units. Um, so what we would initially do is prepare detailed local multipliers using the census uh, pumps data, the public use microdata sample, which is the microdata, every single record cross tabulated 
to hopefully um, fit the needs and fit the experience that's been seen in Ridgewood. Um, I looked at the study that had been done previously for the school district, and it really gets into a lot of detail about the number of school children in multifamily buildings in particular. Um, and it's very, very interesting because there are several buildings that one would think would generate school children that do not, and others that are, you know, one bedroom buildings, primarily one bedroom buildings that have a lot of kids. So looking in more detail at the specifics of those sites will help guide the uh, variables that we select to try to test the uh, multiplier. So going forward, we'll have a decent and uh, usable and useful um, child generation rate and also a resident generation rate. Uh, we'll also look at the village and school district budget budgets to uh, compile fiscal inputs on a per capita basis. Um, I believe right now the school district budget is about $17,000 um, per school child. However, that rate isn't quite accurate. Um, there are economies of scale. You're not going to have an entirely new school superintendent staff because you have 100 new school children. Um, so we'll work with you to have come down to a marginal cost estimate of what it actually costs per new child. Um, and then we'll also do that for community facilities, working with BNJ, who will um, take care of the community facilities analysis. We'll try to come up with marginal costs for the other big ticket items in the municipal budget, like fire and police and safety. Traffic. Um, this summarizes the traffic analysis that we do. We made some changes since our first proposal to you. We looked at the existing traffic studies that were done for the various developments and for your parking deck, and uh, we concluded that we should do an additional count, an additional three intersections in the study area to give us a good base of the traffic that exists today and that we would analyze uh, the traffic conditions at nine intersections in the study area. Uh, so we will analyze existing conditions, so that's levels of what we call levels of service, delays, volume, capacity ratios at nine intersections, and then we will analyze the traffic conditions that would exist under the existing zoning scenario, and then as well under the proposed zoning scenario, so that we have basically you know, these two comparisons, very detailed for nine intersections. We talked among ourselves, you know, whether we should do more than nine intersections, and ideally, yes, one should always, you know, study more. But I feel, I, I spent some time looking at the studies that were done, I feel very comfortable that with nine intersections, we can give you the information to make a decision on the zoning. That's the key information. And we don't feel that you need to do more studies than nine, no more intersections than nine to make that particular decision. So that's a, a key point and I can answer more questions if you have those. So that's basically summarizes uh, the slide that we have here, you know, and, and as Susan mentioned, the most important thing is to develop those two scenarios on the existing conditions and then the future zoning changes. This map, this graph, summarizes the traffic counts that have been done. You can see the different colors, you know, the ones that were done for your proposed parking deck, and the different developments, the Dayton, Chestnut Village, Enclave. And then in red are those that we think are probably useful to do additional new counts that we would do as, if we get selected, as soon as you decided, we would do those counts for the morning peak period and the afternoon peak period. Community facilities, I think we addressed it to some degree. You know, we will look at the impact on water, sewer, emergency services, police, and so on, uh, using your statistics, working with your staff uh, to, again, compare the two scenarios, existing zoning versus proposed zoning. Uh, these are potential add-on tasks. So if you do want to do more intersections, we're prepared to do it. Uh, obviously, it takes more time, it takes more budget. We can also do an analysis, a, a more an aesthetic analysis of the different zoning analysis. We do, as we uh, mentioned before, we have urban designers that uh, are architects by training. They can show graphically how the different zoning um, uh, scenarios could look like. 
And finally, so that we end on the time here, <laughs> why our team? Um, I think our, obviously a big advantage of our team is we have all the capabilities within one office. We work together on a regular basis. We can address zoning, traffic, you know, we do a lot of site plan uh, work. We, I think we are very good at developing reasonable future scenarios. And again, uh, we think it's a key uh, task here. What is the future you know, under existing zoning? What would it be in the, the proposed zoning? We are very responsive and flexible. I hope you will check on our references that we gave you. We as principals, the three of us, we will be involved in this work. We will participate at the public hearings. Uh, our firm is known for that. We are a relatively small firm where the principals are involved. Finally, I think we, we always uh, do our work on time and within budget. Uh, we will not come back to you and ask for more money un unless the scope of work changes, obviously. I think that finishes our presentation. We are one minute short. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, give you so, we'll be happy to answer the questions. Great, thank you so much. Where do I, do we start down here now? Yeah, yeah Mike, okay. we'll start with you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I was just wondering if you can maybe expand and explain a little bit uh, some of the advantages as you see them with having all, all of these, um, sort of all of these disciplines underneath the same umbrella and um, how that might work better than having different consultants. Well, I think the, you know, the disciplines are interconnected. You know, they're all related to traffic, to the zoning scenario, to the schools and all of that. So in that sense, you will get a very unified conclusion, meaning we will work together, the three of us, and, and you know, coordinate our assumptions. And that's critical. If you have different firms involved, you may, have different, you may start with different assumptions. And it's going to be difficult to do an apples and uh, to apples comparison. Thank you. As far as um, time is concerned, I mean, it, to a large extent, this is going to be an iterative process, especially as far as the fiscal analysis. Um, getting at those marginal costs with community facilities and the fact that we're in-house and we can just hand off or, you know, walk around the bay to say, hey, Susan, I have a question on this, or what do you think, is a huge advantage as far as time savings, especially given the relatively short time frame. Thank you. Hi, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, so I saw the you know, the different um, break, breakouts of your expertise. And the first one about the build-out analysis, um, you mentioned that um, it develop, uh, analyze what is reasonable development for sites based on market indications. And then later on, you also gave the opportunity, uh, oh, and you also talk about other develop, development potentials for the sites would be interesting, but then you also have an option, an add-on option, for the um, ripple effect benefit study. It's that implant, which is a social matrix of it all. And I think I find that extremely interesting because, you know, this is market driven, and I'm sure the developers are going to, at the end of the day, you know, do what is financially beneficial to them if they can. Um, but, but as a council reviewing whether or not to adopt these ordinances, we have the option to sort of guide them toward multifamily housing if that is deemed to be more beneficial to the intersections and more beneficial to the economy. Um, so I was really interested in what you have to say about the, uh, the, the implant and or the social accounting metrics. Well, I think there's a couple of things going on. Um, one as far as coming up with a reasonable development scenario. Um, as BFJ in particular is working on this, we'll be able to look at it and say, you know, it's great <coughs> if it's zoned for a lot of extra office space, but there's really not that much of a market for it right now, or there's not that much of a market. Um, so we'll just cast our eye on that to kind of make sure things are in line with what we know about market trends in Bergen at the moment. Um, as far as implant is concerned, that becomes really interesting, um, especially after you look at the fiscal analysis, what it's going to, what the balance is in terms of, you know, tax revenues, expected tax revenues versus expected costs to the municipality. You can also look at the benefits in terms of employment and wages, local employment and wages that come out of the operations and uh, residency of any new 
buildings, um, as well as the uh, short-term benefit that comes from construction. Did I? Is that a unique uh, thing to look at that, or do what percentage do people consider that? The indirect benefits or costs of development. That, in my experience, usually comes about when site plan evaluation is being done. When a developer comes forward with a plan, um, the ZBA um, will require that sort of analysis just to see what the true benefits will be, um, or the complete benefits would be to the municipality. Hmm. Um, it's becoming more and more common, but very often it's an add-on later on I'm cutting my own throat here, but um, that the municipality gets the developer to pay for later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Albert, I just have a question about aspect four of your proposal. I guess that was me, with all apologies. Uh, it, it appears that uh, the, the other areas, school impact and, and traffic, um, are, are less, um, there's three of them. We have a build out analysis. Fiscal and school Im <coughs> impact and traffic impact, they are a little more self-explanatory because you've given such a good explanation. Anyway, in respect of number four, the community facilities and infrastructure, I heard you recognize that there is a revenue side to that equation, and uh, I appreciate that. One of the elements I didn't hear you mention, and maybe it's not a, an element of the revenue generation, is additional spending within the community as an impact of residences within the community. Is that... Is, is that negligible or is that a consideration? Uh, that would be something that would be taken uh, if we went forward with the economic analysis mm -hmm. using in-plan. We could use that. To, and if you want to, we could certainly do that to help yeah. inform the zoning decisions. Yeah. But that's well, I, an I, aspect. I, I think it's a necessary uh, analysis if one is looking at the expense side to also look at the, you know, the, the revenue side so that we can net out the impact in a, in a reasonable way. In looking at the expense side of the ledger, um, I'd ask you, and we're talking now about infrastructure and costs to the village, not, not the schools. I'd ask you to just say a little more, if you can, about you know, where, you, where you reach that ex-citizen who's come to reside in Ridgewood that causes us to increase the size of the water utility, or that ex-citizen who has now caused us to hire an additional fireman, fire person, um, and, and the like. I, I'm just, because you, you did mention marginal costs, and I'm glad that, you know, obviously you're, you're sensitive to that. The other is too, is too blunt an ax if you just take the average cost and keep adding it up. Right. But anyway, I'm sorry, let me let you it's, comment. Well, it's two sides. It's, it's first figuring out what is the population change, so how many mm -hmm. more people are we talking about, um, and how are they housed? Are, are they, is it all residential? Is it a mix of commercial and residential? There are different right. uh, factors, particularly with water and sewer, and also with, with the emergency services, the number of calls. So there's different, you know, different impacts there. So that's the first side. And then the, the other side of that is really in close coordination with you know, your department heads and to try to understand what is the current capacity? What are the plans for any upgrades, any expansions? Is there anything that's already on the, on the books, basically, or already planned um, that these projected population increases might fit into. Um, if it's sort of over and above what the capacity is or whatever is planned, mm -hmm. um, then that's when you're looking at actual costs. So there's no, you know, there's no 100% sure. answer that I can yep. give you right now, but I think we would, we, would, we would have to talk very closely with your department heads, with your utility providers to really understand what is the state now mm -hmm. of Ridgewood's utilities, and then we could go from there. Great. Well, that's good. It's very helpful. And, and I really do appreciate that you're not just into finding the average cost per citizen. And if we're going to have 12 average citizens, then we multiply that number by 12, which is clearly bad math. But great. thank you. So um, thank you. I actually um, appreciated your identifying the new set of multipliers for the educational component. I thought that was really um, spot on, given the uh, Rutgers study. and. Uh, the infrastructure I was comfortable with. I was I was a little concerned with the traffic impact study and a reliance on uh, already existing data. And I, I just was having some difficulty with that because part of the reason that we took this approach um, and looking for someone to do these comprehensive studies was to have a fresh set of eyes and an independent, really independent look at this. And so it does concern me that there's a reliance on 
existing data, and I'm just curious, where is that data generated from, and I'm sure it's in here somewhere, and how old is that data, and is there going to be a difference, uh, obviously a difference in cost if you are going to have to compile your own new data, and also I was a little bit concerned at the, um, using the AM, PM peak hours, and, and that approach, because Ridgewood is a unique community with a lot of things going on in what would be considered necessarily off-peak hours, but are they're usually peak for us. And so I just wanted to know how you factored that into this. Well, um, <clears throat> let me talk first about the existing data. The traffic studies that have been done for the developments and for the Hudson parking uh, deck, um, <clears throat> they have uh, traffic counts that were done in 2011, I think, was the oldest, 2012, 2013, and 14. We can uh, update those because we know from other counts done in the area how traffic has increased on a year-by-year -year basis. And typically in an area like this, it does not increase or has not increased a lot over the last few years. But we, will, we would look into that. And then by doing additional three counts, we can see a little bit you know, how these volumes on these legs compare to adjacent volumes. And we, we generally compare that to make sure that the traffic volumes are correct. You have had a consultant who has reviewed those applications and has reviewed the counts that were done. So I think they have already been reviewed to some degree. Um, Peak the other hours question right? was, um, should I continue? It's like <laughs> a game show. <laughs> uh, the oh, peak, peak, peak hours. hours. Right. Yeah, what happens is, and, and you have had that done, uh, people put out these tube counters that uh, tell us on a 15 minute by 15 minute basis how much traffic there is. So we can see very clearly when the peak hours occurs. And we typically do, you know, when we do these additional intersections, we count for two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, and then we find out within that two hour period where is the actual peak period. And then we assume that the peak traffic, you know, occurs during that same time period. So it's a kind of worst case assumption that traffic engineers do for that analysis. It's a very common analysis. The thing that we would do a little bit differently from what was done in the past, I think we have to take into consideration we're not in a pure suburb here. You're in a, in a village community and there is a number of people that's walking. Some of the, whether it's residential uses or retail or restaurants, some people will walk to and from those uses. That has to be taken into consideration, and the past studies did not do that. We would take that into consideration because I think in some places it is a significant, it makes a significant difference. Great, thank you very much, and I think our time is up. Thank so thank, thank you very thank you. much. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Really appreciate Watch it. Watch your step. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. We're losing somebody up here. Uh, maybe we'll take a minute to Opera comes back and then uh, maybe uh, Roberta and Bobby can share your thoughts with us on sort of so next I steps. I'm sorry, I might, we're I'm, we're going to share our thoughts. Oh, share our thoughts. Yeah, but I'm Thank sorry. You. I guess it just turned off. Let's just wait for Albert to come back and then uh, sure. we'll continue. Sure. Great. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I hope he didn't stop to talk to somebody. Should we page him? I just think he had Should we clap because he's coming through his ear? Take your time. Just take your time. Take your time. All right, Roberta, Bob, uh, your thoughts and sort of our next step. So without touching anything. I am not touching anything. <laughs> I'm not touching anything. Um, I think I think a couple of things. Uh, you know, I leave it up to the council to have a discussion. Um, no, they can't hear that, you. Can you hear me? Barely. Can you hear me? I, okay, thank you. Um, I do leave it up to the council, obviously, to have a discussion. I think a couple of things. I think, um, importantly, I think all of them were credible. I said that before. Um, I think we um, we brought in some very good people and in certain ways. Um, some decisions are six of one, half dozen of another. Um, uh, having said that, uh, if you'd like, <coughs> it could uh, provide you with what we think the scenario is, uh, and this would rather not be waived, wavered by us, whatever the, it's up to you guys. Well, why don't we do this? I mean, what we want to do tonight is take an informal head count because we want to put forward resolutions tomorrow night, adopting resolutions <coughs> and hiring one or more of these Hi. firms. Uh, let me just begin by thanking both you and Bob, uh, and as well as Gwen and Susan for identifying these firms. Uh, for getting us ready for this evening. I think, I think you did an excellent job. I think all five were fantastic. Uh, and I think this has been a good discussion. What I would suggest maybe is we get some uh, council thoughts sure. on this. Uh, if anyone has a particular firm or firms or any idea, any questions you want to raise now, and then uh, maybe we can see if our thoughts match up with yours. And then- uh, and we, we wrote them down, so. Okay, <laughs> so hide them right now. So with that, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to begin. Any particular thoughts on one or more of these firms? Uh, I have some thoughts, but I'll, 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 I'll save them. Mike, did you want? Yeah, I'll start. Um, uh, for traffic, I like the um, presentation from um, R RBA and, and Mazer. Uh, I like the idea of using um, video, video counts and looking at over a period of multiple days and Saturdays to, um, to really drill down and see what, what's happening at these intersections. And I also like the fact that um, RBA mentioned that they, they take into account bicyclists and pedestrians, because that's if, if we're talking about the CBD, it's very important. You have to think of everybody who uses the road. It's not, it's mo mainly focused on automobiles, but there's also pedestrians, there's, there's bicyclists, there's, there's a lot of things to, to take into account other than that. Um, so, I mean, I. Mazer, I guess they have um, that they, they didn't didn't have too defined of a plan yet. So the knowing the cost up front from from what they would want to do is is kind of difficult. Where RBA had um, you know they had, had Mr. Meth gave a defined sort of scope of what he was he intended to look at, and um, it seemed like he had a better you know a, a better handle on on where to start. And uh, he seems he, he seems like he'd be flexible to. Um, Kind of, kind of expand if he really needed to. Um, I, I, I did like um, Urbanomics, uh, BFJ. They are all under the same, uh, all under the same, you know, umbrella. So they're all together. They can save time. They can um, get information back and forth. But I thought their uh, their traffic presentation was was weak. So um, I mean, I would like to maybe look at them for the other three studies, and then perhaps <coughs> RBA for traffic, but I mean, they're my initial thoughts, so I'd like okay. to hear what everybody else has to say, but that's the first thing that pop, popped in there. Great, thanks Mike. Gwen? 
Thanks. Um, so of the five categories or so, I, I get, well, right, I added a fifth one, which I like the build-out analysis, and I don't know that that has to be included, but um, traffic, I think, was uh, probably, uh, no, I, I, I believe it was fiscal impact was the one that all five of us said we could benefit from that in some way. Um, and I thought BFJ would be good for that, urbanomics. Uh, so that, I don't know if we can use them to study Haber's school uh, children analysis. But if we could, then it would be like the, because I know often the school children um, and fiscal impact, they're the closely, two most closely linked aspects. Traffic, I liked RBA um, without a doubt. I thought that was the best and for the price uh, too, it made sense. Infrastructure and build out analysis, I was interested from BFJ Urbanomics. Great, thank you. Albert. Looks like we may have a consensus developing here. Uh, clearly, I, I favor Ross Haber that we continue with him in his educational study. He has done a lot of work, and again, I, I had the privilege of seeing his presentation, and it was really quite good. Uh, and I think BFJ can use the resultant data. Uh, I think they are good en enough to they don't have to do their own head counts and, and statistical analyses. They can do the digestion and, and uh, implication analysis of that. So I would use BFJ for the fiscal impact and for the community facilities impact, which frankly, I think are, are one and the same. But anyway, if they see it as too, fine. And, and, and obviously, uh, Gordon Meth was, in terms of price, much better than Mazer, but apart, even apart from that, I thought it's great to have somebody like Gordon Meth of RBA take a second look at the traffic report that has already been done by Mazer. To the extent there may have been shortcomings in what Mazer has heretofore done, it is very good that we're not going back to the same well and we're going to someone to take a fresh look at it. So I, I would opt for, again, just to summarize, BFJ for fiscal and community facilities impact, RBA for traffic, and uh, Ross Haber for education impact. Great. Thank you, Albert. Susan. Um, <clears throat> so I thought RBA was especially outstanding, Gordon Meth, um, especially given the pedestrian safety and circulation that he raised. And uh, so I was real happy with Gordon Meth. Um, and I, I agree with Albert um, in terms of Russ Haber. And, but I actually thought that uh, Higher Gruel was stronger on the fiscal. Um, I actually thought that they seem to, I'm just going through my notes, they just seem to have a better handle. I, I actually found um, BFJs to be a little bit weak. And uh, although I did like the uh, infrastructure analysis, but I think Higher Gruel also raised that as an issue. So I, I, I agree that I think that it seems to be somewhat the same, and if they could do the uh, infrastructure analysis, it might be interesting, but um, that's my take. Can I just add, Susan, I apologize, but, but I think, again, if you use, if Russ Haber produces the data, I think the uh, BFI can make use of that data effectively. Yes. And so my thinking is, RBA, uh, Haber also, uh, I think in part, uh, I really liked his presentation uh, way he got into the details. Plus, you know, I know the Board of Education was very happy with him, uh, with their work with him, and so, uh, and he's, he's come to know our community very recently, so I'd like that. Uh, and BFJ, uh, I was thinking also both for uh, fiscal impact as well as uh, community services or whatever, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those are our thoughts. Do they match up with, how do they match yeah, up with I, your they, thoughts? They, ma they match up, uh, Pretty darn, pretty darn good. I would just add a couple of things, and then uh, Bob can as well. Um, I would give us, I would give an edge to RBA on traffic. Um, I would definitely do do that. Um, let me also say that you know this is kind of a stilted kind of presentation where you get to ask them a couple sure. of questions. I mean, we spent time with each of these groups. I mean, we mm -hmm. spent quality time. So we had meetings that went an hour and a half, an hour. You know, we brought people in, mm -hmm. and you just get more texture and stuff. Um, so it's interesting that you kind of came up to the same conclusions we did. Um, so I would do uh, RBA on traffic. I would do Ross Haber on um, education. Um, so I, I agree with a couple of you on that. Um, as far as um, BFJ, I would use them as the hub. Um, they would be the right. financial impact hub. And 
the, the other spokes would be coming in feeding, uh, feeding information into them. The one area I feel less comfortable with, and I, I, we have to go sit down with Susan uh, Favate again, is I'm not clear on the infrastructure piece. Mm. I think it's overpriced. I, I think um, uh, given the fact that there's some very, I hate to call them simple, but there's some simple analysis that has already been done yeah. on wastewater, mm -hmm. on water, uh, on police, on service calls and stuff like that. I do think that uh, this is data that was collected by um, village employees um, and it, it's fairly objective. Well, it is, it's not fairly, it's objective. So, I, you know, I think um, if you noted, it was really only BFJ that did infrastructure. Right. Yeah. So they're the only real choice. Mm -hmm. Right. On that yeah. So you just want to go back with them on cost, is what you're I, saying. I have a little bit of a kind of a question on, on the cost issue because I don't know and what they'll be collecting considering, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would be looking at them from an audit standpoint, looking at the data that's been collected and challenging it. I wouldn't be looking at mm -hmm. them. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I Roberta, I, it's interesting. I, I thought both the first and the last presenters were somewhat weak in the facilities impact infrastructure impact, and they both indicated that they would have to rely upon the department heads to Absolutely. tell them, well, you know, as consultants often do, you give them the data and they give it back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think I can understand why they would have to do that. I mean, how can somebody come from outside and tell us, you're gonna expand that water utility unless we tell them where the, you know, where the, uh, the, the limitations of the facility are, et cetera. But the so. other thing I liked about BFJ a lot is um, their, Emphasis on build-out scenarios, I think, is really key as the beginning of this effort. Really key. Yeah. Because when you start thinking about things like water, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know people probably would think, because we had drought restrictions, we have a water problem. That's, as you all know, that's not really exactly correct. Um, and as you do build-out scenarios, and you look at some of this multifamily housing, the biggest consumer of water during drought is Irrigation. lawn sprinkling. Yeah. You know, we go from five million gallons, you know, a day to fourteen million dollars, fourteen million gallons a day in peak season. So, um, you know, it, some would argue that other uses could, in fact, generate more water usage. So, I think this whole emphasis on let's do the build-out scenarios first and let's get them right, mm -hmm. and, and they'd have to again work closely with Blaze and, and others to do that. Um, I thought also was, was key. You know, the one thing I also wanted to point out about BFJ is that. Um, Having their uh, familiarity now with Ridgewood, if if we engage them, um, also their experience with the affordable housing components outside in other areas, and actually maybe that's something that we can draw on in the future uh, to help with our needs. So to sum so up, I'd like Bob oh, I'm to sorry. Kind of oh, please, sorry. Because he was involved. In, well, again, Blaze was scheduled to be here on Friday, and I think he would have basically. I can't speak to him right now, but I think he would have come down. Uh, I'm sorry, he would have come down similar way, I think. Okay. So I concur with everything, and I'll, I'll just give you my two cents on it. I would look to BFJ to be the lead. I think being that they have the expertise in four of these areas, they'd be able to coordinate these efforts and pull everything together. Okay. Um, uh, RBA, I think, w was top notch. I, I really liked the approach that they had, um, unique to everybody else. Uh, but it seemed more realistic as far as rather than staying there counting numbers, you know, they have a visual and they could integrate that whole thing. Um, Haber, I would support one because I know uh, uh, Board of Education is very happy with his services. He's had, you know, he's got some good credentials. He's got experience dealing with them. Don't forget, we're on a timetable here, and I think the way we can expedite this and get quality service is going to be important as well. So. His knowledge of the Board of Education, I think, is going to be very key to meeting these deadlines. Um, and uh, so that's where I am. I, I, and I do agree with vetting the uh, community service piece of this a little, maybe get a better understanding <coughs> since they are the only ones that are doing this. Uh, we just need to have a conversation with them as to what makes sense and the pricing that goes with it. And I did have a conversation with uh, Dan Fishbein relative to this to see where he was, you know, how comfortable he felt. Because actually, He's the one who has to also feel comfortable with mm -hmm. what the results are, and he was very comfortable with uh, very comfortable with Ross Haber. Thought he did a really good job. So, so to sum up and see if everybody's in agreement here, uh, <laughs> along the lines of what Bob just said, uh, it would be going with BFJ to not only do the fiscal impact and the community impact, if you will, uh, and the, as well as the build-out analysis, 
but also to take the lead and feeding into that would be Haber and education and RBA, RBA in terms of traffic. Correct. Is that the only one thing I, I just, um, when we get down to the nuts and bolts of this, I think we really have to look, know which intersections and have a little bit more information about, th Bob Shakin said thank you. Yeah, yeah, we were fine we that down. Fine that. I think yeah. the whole issue is, and, and I think the thing that we really have to um, talk to uh, Gordon Meth about mm -hmm. is what New Jersey DOT requirements we use as far as dispersal of traffic, mm -hmm. and, and that's key. Um, and so, again, uh, he's the expert. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point. I think it's important for us to feed into, you know, the information to these studies. But these are the experts we're hiring, and we don't want to engage them. To, I don't, I don't, I don't want to micromanage what they're doing. I mean, they they know this stuff, whether it's the education, the fiscal. We can feed into, but at the end of the day, they're the experts. I mean, we'll be on top of them from the point of view of getting this the thing done, just as we did with the parking tech. Um, and making sure they have access to whatever information they need. <laughs> issue there is that you know, <coughs> people that are very, you know, the planner is really tied up with a whole lot of other stuff, so we have to figure out how to, you know, get, you know, get this done. And I would say the other thing is, um, you know, we're coming on budget season, and we, we do have to um, budget for this. Um, right. So I just put that out there. Um, Can I ask a question? I, it crossed my mind almost as you brought that up, and maybe it's too early to ask it, but... Um, are we going to allocate this to the planning board or to the county? I mean, who? It, it's funny because I'm wondering: is this this isn't just going to inform multifamily <coughs> housing because the uh, because the council uh, voted to do studies? It will inform the rewriting of the master plan, won't it? Yeah, but, but the planning board. We are the planning board, and the planning board is us. Yeah, we're, we're paying oh, for okay. it. I mean, we'll, they can certainly you know, benefit from this information. Yeah, I just yeah. thought, what category do you put it under? <coughs> They, they, you know, they would have access to what we do, but I, you know, is, is this a council or a planning board exercise? Is, yeah, I think it's clearly a council exercise. This yeah. is strictly a council exercise. Right. It's strictly a council function as part of the master plan process. Right. So there really just, isn't any way to get it. Yeah, I was just referring to the fact that if, regardless of where we budget it, it's the Ridgewood taxpayer. Right. That's, that's all yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Okay. And just so you know, you just used all your operating budget for the council issue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Great. Well, this has been a useful conversation, uh, and I'm glad we're all in agreement. And we can go forward, and tomorrow night we can have the resolutions uh, memorializing this. <coughs> Great. You did. And, and, and again, I just want to, again, I know Gwen and Susan, you know, suggested some names of these firms, and thank you for that. Uh, but you guys did a lot of the legwork and uh, really got this ready for tonight, so thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, really, you did. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yes, thank you. That as well. As well, and that picked up slack and other things so that we were able to do this, so. It and through the holidays, time. also, yeah. yeah through, the holidays. through the holidays. So thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. Great. Good. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Janet Fricky over here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Janet. Thank you, Janet. Hey, Janet. Janet. All right. Thank you. You're one of those people, so thank you. And now we'll go back to public comments. Anyone has a comment? Uh, five minutes a person. Microphone's over there. Don't trip as you're running across. Good evening. Welcome. Spooky cloud. Um, good evening. I'm Martin Walker at uh, 114 College Place. This is Can really you repeat a, that? I didn't hear you. Uh, Martin Walker, 114 College Place. This is a really uh, enjoyable, interesting, and uh, very informative evening. So I thank all of you oh. for putting that together. Um, I just want to make a couple of points. Uh, one is really general and I think so important, one a couple of specific ones. And just by start by asking the question, oh, why is hindsight 2020 vision? And the reason for that is that poor planning can be summarized simply as a failure to see the future. We already have plenty of areas in town that show evidence of this, <coughs> the clearest one, is where developers have built without being required to put in sidewalks. All the studies we're talking about can make the most sense if they're framed around a vision of what we want Ridgewood to be. And I don't know that we have a mechanism for doing that. It's possible to achieve that kind of mechanism uh, and frame these granular studies 
within a future search community exercise, which is something that's been done all over the country, uh, even all over the world, and that provides a, fu provides a future vision of what our, of, of the community that people who live here and work here and govern here, that they actually want to live in and see in the future. Um, it's, it's not an obscure methodology. You can look at it on the internet. And I, and I suspect very clearly that um, BFJ, from listening to what they're presenting, that they'd be perfectly capable of doing that um, and putting that together for us. So I think it should be considered. Um, the more specific concerns that I had, and, and I, they were partly addressed, but I don't think they're addressed enough, is how the traffic studies uh, are going to be framed to include pedestrian and bike use around our current community goals that are enshrined in the commitment to the complete streets. Um, and I think this is not just something as a future aspiration. I think we have catching up to do. Um, I don't actually feel, I'm worried that, for instance, our town planner is not proactive enough in applying complete streets initiatives. I've been on observing and then participating in the uh, Citizen Safety Committee for about five years now, and we're clearly, it's clearly not a, t a town initiative to actually go ahead and, and, and make that happen. Um, from the presentations, it seemed that RBA and, and uh, BFJ were more focused on that, and that can be something that's essential. Um, the other significant concern for how to plan these studies is to look at the increased utilization of special ed services in Ridgewood, because Ridgewood is nationally famous for our special ed services. Mm -hmm. Good reason, I have a daughter who's, who receives special ed services, mm -hmm. so I can testify from my personal experience. One thing that needs to be factored into this in terms of housing is that there's certain kinds of housing that are actually essential for certain special ed families. There's a whole category of special ed needs where you cannot live in a house that is outdoor space. So given that there's a national population <coughs> that is, is, is basically has a demand for these kinds of services, I would like to know how, uh, you know, how the uh, um, consultants are going to survey this particular demand, which could be fulfilled by the kind of housing that we could have. Um, finally, <coughs> I guess in, I would say to your council, to our council, to really try to think about yourself, regardless of whether or not we can apply a future search methodology, is what is your personal view of what our future should, like, should look like. I think there's a really easy way to encapsulate my view, which you've heard in a variety of settings, and it's simply to look at the numbers and set out to create a village where there are equal numbers of grandparents, parents, and children. You can lay this foundation out so that for every two children, there are two elders, no matter where they live, no matter how they're related. I don't know if any of the current density housing is going to be required to be 55 in order to achieve this, but since it can't, there is definitely a formula which can make that happen. And so that's, that's my strongest appeal. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I, I would just like to say uh, one thing um, regarding complete streets because I disagree with your assessment on not being aggressive enough. And I'm just uh, uh, kind of responding to your comment on one of our staff members. Um, Blaze is not really responsible for complete streets. It sits, as I think you know, in the engineering department and it also sits with what I call CSAC. Um, and I think to some degree, and I don't want to go there tonight as far as issues, but I would say many uh, of the complete, maybe not many, some of the complete streets initiatives have been thwarted not by uh, village staff, but um, if you believe in it, by part of the political process. And I, I'm not going further than that tonight, but I just. Uh, no, I appreciate that clarification. My, my concern going forward really has to do with master plan divisions and not seeing how that's been yeah, I, I, get, I, I get it, Mark. Good evening, Bill McCandless, 71 Ridge Road. 
Uh, just a, que a question regarding, maybe not a question, just uh, an observation regarding the parking deck. Um, and this may have been covered in the separate longer sessions that, that were had with the village uh, in each group, was that the assumption was laid in that the deck was there. Um, as part of that, I'm wondering what load was commuter in that, because that would, uh, that would change uh, the amount of traffic coming in and out, and the volume of that would hit during the day versus, um, what, let's call it, uh, the shoppers that we would think of at uh, different peak times. So if those assumptions were built into what we handed out or what will be tweaked now in the process that comes out of the vote tomorrow night, I just I would really want to dial in on what scenarios we present um, regarding the parking situation, because we have continually said that that commuters will be a big part of what happens in parking. Mm -hmm. And so that is currently Great not point. a load that sits in that space or hits any of those intersections. Secondarily, as we look at commuters coming in to use the deck, none of the um, intersections that were targeted included Monroe and West Ridgewood Avenue. And um, as someone who deals with Garber Square on multiple times every day, and I, I know the deputy mayor does at the same time, um, we need, I think, to at least look down the road a little bit metaphorically and physically, that uh, we're seeing traffic stretching down there that has never happened before. <laughs> and so I was, I was taken uh, by the gentleman who everyone seems to love for traffic talking about 90 second cycles. And as I sit on Corsi Terrace waiting morning after morning for those cycles, I'm seeing that stretch down. I, I just hope that we can roll that in as part of that So um, every one of the consultants we spoke with, um, we asked to do an analysis of the intersection at, at by Garber Square, West Ridgewood, Godwin, you know, that area. Oh. Um, so uh, Gordon has it in his, and the other ones have it in theirs as well. The uh, and also presenter. because, remember, because Ken Smith is, uh, Monroe, I'm thinking about, well, Monroe's the other issue. I mean, there really is a traffic issue between Monroe, Lincoln, and that area, as opposed to, and that's the worst condition of the Garber Square condition. Yeah, you talk about bad geometry for traffic, right? So yeah. we, we all live through that one, and I, I know as soon as we start adding one, that we're suddenly going to be a Midland Park during traffic analysis. But, <laughs> but when we look at school impact and we talk about GW and Ridge, we're talking about West Ridgewood and Monroe. We're talking about crossing guards and parents making decisions on who walks and who doesn't walk by what time of day a you know, crossing guard goes out. So I, I would hope that we could push one extra intersection down the road to West Ridgewood there. Um, on a process level, thank you very much for moving the meeting, first of all. Um, and thank you for this incredibly uh, transparent presentation. I know there was not an RFP issued in Roberta, and I had some emails back across this today. Was it necessary? I, but, well, I, I think on a transparency level, it would been really helpful to know what each firm was asked to come in and present. And I think that that would have been helpful to the audience and would be helpful as we as we go forward, as we talk about this tomorrow night, of, uh, you know, we're, we're making a big ask. We have a short time frame. Um, and it's still unclear to me what we ask. And so, if you look at the last presenter, uh, when they laid out their traffic map, they did not have Garber Square as, as one of those. And so you start to wonder, well, what data points was everyone getting? We, we didn't really have as an audience that opportunity to know that. I think this would have been, a, 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 as we look for future processes, the more we can put out, the more we can say, this is what we're asking of each one of these firms. Here's what the data points are that we've told them. If we're not going to do an RFP, I think as a village, we really owe it to ourselves to say, this is how we're asking for this information, and this is how we expect it to be presented. Yeah. And so. I, I thought we were cl quite clear in the December 9th meeting. I mean, we went through details on what we were asking for. Well, so. but then tonight we did have discussion about whether or not North Walnut was included or not. So I, I understand that, but when the presentations reflected that that was not clearly sent out to a firm, and those of us who've done consulting know that we're not hitting the data points, we're not getting the job. So, um, but again, I think it's a great meeting, and I look forward to the next steps. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Ellen McNamara, 120 West Ridgewood Avenue. I'd like to concur with um, my neighbors who just spoke both so well. Um, and I agree with them on, uh, you know, well, I don't need to go into it. Um, you know, it just occurred to me while I was listening to these experts, um, professionals in their fields, listening to their prior experience and seeing that all these other towns, um, all different types of demographics, looking to them for their services, for their professional um, uh, input for making decisions for their towns. I don't, you know, this was so contentious for a while there. This meeting tonight was so um, refreshing because there was an agreement and 
um, there was discussion, and, and I feel like we're all kind of coming from the same place, but it took a really long time to get here, and I don't understand why, um, you know, other towns that neighbor us or not, that we like to compare ourselves to or not, are using these professionals. So I, I just, I think that's a, that's a point worth mentioning. Um, the North Walnut Street redevelopment, I'm, I'm, you know, that's one area that I'm quite foggy on, and um, it seems like everybody is a little bit, which is why it's not being considered um, by these professionals yet, and I, I think it should be, um, maybe. I don't really know much about it. Um, maybe that's the point. Um, I was happy tonight after, you know, the first meeting I think that I went to regarding all of this, I got up and I spoke about, um, I got a little emotional, surprise, surprise. Um, the traffic expert that spoke um, was talking about the Rutgers study and, oh, there's standards and we just look at these numbers and they apply to all municipalities. And I, I got up and I said, but Ridgewood isn't all municipalities. And, and I felt like every single person that, um, a firm that presented tonight recognized that and they're going to address that. So that was great. Um, and, and yet, you know, coming back to what Walter had to say so well, um, having a vision and a plan, I, I, I don't really know what, and nothing against Blaze personally, but it, maybe it's the position in this town and what, it, what kind of reach the position is given, but why don't we have a more clear vision of what, what's gonna happen next, what we want for our town, what we want it to look like? Um, I think that would really help all of this um, go much more smoothly and, and certainly with a lot less contention. Um, and, uh, and, and as Dave mentioned earlier, to have resident input is critical if you're talking about a plan and a vision for the town where we all live. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hi. Lorraine Reynolds, 550 Windermere. Um, I really just, I want to talk about Gordon Meff. I thought his presentation was great, but one thing he said uh, just stuck in my mind. He said it would be a few days of collecting data. So I know that the other company said that they would do it for seven days. So, and he, did you hear him say a few? Is that true? Or did I misinterpret it? Two, did you say two days? He said a few days. A few days. He did say a few days. So, I mean, what days would he, you know, I think Saturday has to be done, Sunday has to be done, and I, I mean, I, I would, I think seven days sounds much better than a few days, and it seems that we didn't see his prices, but just from, you know, comments, it seems that he was much more reasonable. Could we ask him to add some more days? If he's got the cameras there already, I can't imagine that it's going to cost that much more. Because um, certainly Saturday is huge for you know the restaurants. Sunday is huge because of Mount Carmel, and then certainly a few weekdays, I, I believe, would be important. <coughs> And I also, since he does seem to be inexpensive, I wonder if we could ask him about the North Walnut Redevelopment Zone, because obviously something will happen there. Is it, is it something you could talk to him about, possibly adding a potential something there? Just, just to put it in his mind that that's an area that maybe something will happen and maybe he could add it in on a I don't know, a, a, small, a small basis rather than a, a full, you know, traffic study. Um, so those two things, but I, I do think it's really important to have more than just a few days. And then I also would ask, you know, I, I know it's a tight timeline, but certainly Martin Luther King weekend would not be good. and. Certainly, during the February break, would not be good. Can we ask them to avoid definitely those days? And then the last thing is just—I I know they have to be done now, but I do worry 
that January and February are probably the least traveled months of the year. I know certainly when it's cold and snow, you know, in, in the springtime, I leave my house 10, 12 times a day. In the winter, probably twice, you know. I know that my dad is away for months in the winter. I assume there's a lot of snowbirds in Ridgewood that are away. So, I mean, I just think it's something to think about. And I know you can't change it or wait, but it's something to have in the back of your mind. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Saurabh Dhani, S-A-U-R-A-B-H, Dhani, D-A-N-I, B-9 Deep at Foot Road in Ridgewood. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for listening to us and um, initiating these studies and initiating them in such an open manner. It is really, really appreciated and we feel part of the process. So thank you for that. Um, I just had three observations. Um, my first observation was um, that out of these five groups, I think, um, as you already noted, that only one of the groups presented uh, their proposal for impact studies on the utilities. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't see any of you being very enthusiastic about them for their expertise or for their traffic and school. And we are just picking them because they are the only option presented to us. So, um, was it because there was no other, so nobody else who had a bid on that? Or, so it, it just sounds like hey, we have only one option and nobody was excited, but we have to go with them because they are the only options for the water and the police and fire and the other utilities. Um, my second observation was uh, when initially major traffic experts were uh, presenting their numbers, there was some confusion about, they said the DOT recommendation is for 100 cars per intersection and uh, the village manager mentioned that we are looking for an option for 50 cars per intersection, but later um, for which intersections we should pick, um, the village manager mentioned that we should ask uh, Gordon for what is the DOT recommendation. So if we are going with the DOT recommendation, then why are we not going with that 100 number? Why, why do we want to reduce that to 50? Um, so it <coughs> sounds conflicting that in one part we want them to go with the DOT recommendation and one part we want to reduce it by half. Um, and my third observation, which is really concerning, is um, I heard the mayor saying that we don't want to include North Poland in the studies. We all know that something is going there. It's in the plans. Um, it's very much in the advanced plans based on what we heard until all those presentations were done. That is how that place is zoned already. Um, so why would we not consider that? And especially, as we all understand, September 30th vote included all six sites. And it included the parking garage, it included the North Walnut. North Walnut was specifically spoken on the September 30th ordinance or the vote. So if we all know that that is being developed, why would we exclude that unless there is a very compelling reason? I, I just don't understand. Why are we saying, hey, we don't want to include that when we all know that that will be developed and what is this one for that? So those are my three observations and thank you again for all the hard work. Thank you. Great, thank you. I just, I, I'd just like to say a couple of things about this. Um, you know, I brought up the 100 to 50. The consultants did not. And the reason I did that is it's a more conservative number from a village standpoint. Whether or not we go that route, I just wanted to make sure that in the conversation with them, which we've had, um, in our brainstorming and work sessions, that in fact that was still on the table. And that will add some cost to the study if we do that. Whether or not we have to do it, again, I'm gonna go back, we're relying on experts. These people know what they do, they're doing. They know what days to pick. They, they know exactly what they're doing. So that's my comment on 100 to 50. Uh, we may not go with BFJ on um, utilities. I think I said that I'm not 100% comfortable with their cost, I'm not sure. Uh, that they're going to add a lot of value. And so we have to take that back and have another session with them. Um, I'm almost thinking that we might have some village experts uh, present to the council some of the infrastructure stuff that I think mm -hmm. is, again, um, fairly, fairly, uh, fairly good. So uh, as far as North Walnut, I think you heard the uh, comment uh, that I think Susan and BFJ, and I think they're really strong on this point, you really need to understand what your build-out scenarios are. 
And right now, I don't know what the build out scenario is at North Walnut. And, and just to clarify, in North Walnut, un unlike the other properties we're talking about, it's not guaranteed that something will be developed yeah. there. It could stay a parking lot, and that town garage property, which is privately owned, could stay there. They could sell it to someone else. So this, it's it's very different than the other properties we're talking about. I'm sorry, we've, the five minutes is up, though. Yeah, if, we, if we could, thank you. Good evening. Welcome, <coughs> Bill McKay, 96 Avondale Road. First of all, I want to say thanks for this meeting. It was great. I appreciate the council voting to do these studies, and I thought this was a terrific meeting. I'm looking forward to the studies. Um, I, I just had, a, I guess, a question or comment that struck me today, and I don't know if there's a place for this in these studies, but I was commuting to Manhattan today uh, from Hocus, I live closer to Hocus, to Ridgewood, and everyone can get a seat until you get to about a fair lawn, and then it gets very crowded. And so I started thinking about, as we add, many more apartments to Ridgewood, like a commuter quality of life question. Um, and then also I used to take the bus at one point, and I, I don't know anymore, but I understand the phenomenon with the bus is as the bus leaves Ridgewood Ave, as you get closer to the duck pond, your odds of getting a seat go down and down. So people start going closer to town to kind of <laughs> outfox their neighbors. But, you know, there is, there is some issue, I guess, that this is not gonna be senior living or adding many more commuters to our town. I don't, I don't have a question inherently here, but how do we factor that in? Because quality of life and commuting go together, and it's just a thought that struck me today as I sat on the train, happily in the seat, but didn't want that to change. <laughs> but thanks again for the study for the time. Great, thank you. <laughs> I think we have one more coming. Good evening, welcome. Hi, Enid Joseph, 17 North Murray Avenue. I have uh, just two, one question, one comment. Uh, the question is with respect to the study, I think the traffic study that's already underway to take place in two weeks. Did you just say, did you say that? Um, okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah, that there's what, a traffic what's study. Other, what's your other question? Well, that's just that one. And I guess I, and I, my comment to that is, do we have to go through with that study if we're now going to do a more comprehensive study? Okay, so um, the traffic study that I talked about on December 9th in my manager's re uh, report was the one that Mazur had done specifically for the deck and specifically to figure out whether or not we have issues with traffic circulation based on the deck. Um, and that study um, you know, came up with a recommendation that was later supported by Langan um, <coughs> uh, to switch the, the direction of the street and that that would actually make traffic in that area better today than it is today, right? They also made a recommendation that we could go ahead and add some intersections. And that was in December. Um, now, one thing you have to realize about traffic studies is everybody wants to add intersections because they make more money to do that, right? So every traffic study I think I've looked at says, let's add more studies, you know? Um, so, but we decided because of the gravity of the situation with the deck and because we wanted to make sure we were okay, we added um, we added intersections to that study. As somebody pointed out, right now is not a really good time to do uh, traffic analysis and do counts and dispersion and stuff like that, which is why it's lagging a couple of weeks. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... So the answer is that we are having a study in two weeks, and then we are, all, are also hiring these consultants to do another study, which will probably include those intersections as well. They will, they will use the Mazur study for the deck, and they will also question it, because they'll look at it with a fresh set of eyes. So, okay. yeah, I mean, so. So they'll use the information, they won't necessarily repeat the study. Correct. Okay. Because the data is fairly, I mean, as opposed to some of the stuff you heard earlier, where there was data that was at 2011, 2000, mm -hmm. whatever it was, this data is fresh. Right, and is that data being collected by video or is it being collected by the counter? On the maze or the counters? I don't want to answer that question because I'm, I'm actually not sure. Okay. All right, I guess that's fair. I just, I I just wonder, I just based remember. on what the expert said about the video versus the counter, if it might make sense then not to do that study. I think he's using the ATR, but again, I, you know, there's and a I lot of information out here. And it's right. So then my other question is, what is the rush? Why are we moving this within, you know, why is there such a quick time frame 
that it has to happen in. So because of the is, is that your last question? Because I guess my other last question was sure. just with my respect to the water issues. <laughs> We were talking, it wasn't a question, it's a comment. Just that um, I understand that I've done some reading about the recycling of water and if there is anything um, like massive or, res or commercial that's done in those developments that they be required to recycle their water. So even if there are big lawns to water, they're able to do it themselves, which they would be able to do. Thank you. So my question is why the rush? I don't think there is a rush. I think we're doing this in a very deliberate way. I do think there is a there is a clock ticking with respect to affordable housing component of our housing issue, and Matt can speak to that perhaps, and he has spoken to that. But I don't I don't see there being a rush. Well, no, I'm familiar with the affordable housing um, issues. Thank you, and I don't need I don't need to <laughs> I don't need you to repeat it. But um, I guess I'm wondering is so we have a when do we when are we when is the council um, saying they need to have a decision on the garage, Bob. You're talking about the garage, or are you talking about the, the garage? Was, you know, is moving forward on one track. We're talking about housing in another track. I don't. Well, I feel like the garage is being maybe pushed forward. You know, maybe that's. Are they being pushed at the same time, or? Like, I don't think anything is being pushed. Again, I think it's been a very deliberate process, one that might have started 90 years ago. But you know, we've really taken it on over the last couple of years, and I think we've moved forward in a very deliberate, very uh, engaging way as we learn new information. You know, we have Mazer doing more traffic study. If we learn anything from the traffic study that's being done in the context of the housing that can benefit, absolutely, we'll, we'll factor it all in. So is there a specific timeline as to when we, the council will vote on these? Do we have that? Is that set yet? I, I don't know. Which one are you talking about? I'm sorry. Either. With the housing, I know one of the traffic study guys mentioned that I'll have it done. I'll have it done in four weeks. And yeah, the, the housing like there might be a time pressure on them. Sh sure. Are there any other questions? Time. Because we're going back and forth, and I'd, if you have any other questions, otherwise I'll answer that one. But that's it. I'm good. Okay. So with respect to the parking, again, we have uh, I think it's January 29th. We have our ordinance up. Uh, we we introduced the ordinance last week. Yeah. The public hearing is on January 29th. With respect to housing, 27th. 27th, I'm sorry. And with respect to housing, again, we're hoping to have these studies done by the end of February. Uh, we do have a, an affordable housing deadline at the end of March, and so we're trying to get everything done as, as quickly as possible, however, in a very deliberate fashion. I guess I need the timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Good evening. Welcome. John Saracino, 17 Coverage Court. Um, I don't know if Matt, I got here a little late, so I don't know if you introduced it before, but I just wanted to get an update outside of these studies. I know that um, the Consult report, I think, was released and published a few weeks back. Um, and I think there's some case management and other stuff that's going forward in the next couple of weeks. If you could just give us an update of what results of the village's Consult report was. Um. Yeah, John, you're right. The eConsult report, which was the expert that the village hired through the municipal consortium, um, that report uh, was issued on December 30th. Uh, we passed it around. We're starting to talk about it, starting to deal with it. Uh, the numbers were a little bit higher than what we had anticipated. Um, and uh, in terms of dealing with eConsult, we're waiting to hear back from them because we've asked in working in conjunction with the planning board attorney and the and the, um, uh, the planner are waiting to hear back from e-consult for further discussion. Obviously, still in litigation, so we're not going to go into it any further than that. But um, we are still under a court order. Uh, the order was signed on November 25th. That continued our immunity up until the end of March of 2016. I have a report that I have to file with the court by Friday, which talks about the progress that the village has made with regard to adopting a housing element. Uh, the housing element is part of the master plan. Um, in conjunction with that, the actions that were taken here tonight and will be taken tomorrow night are also gonna be part of that report because the timeliness of what we do is the context upon which the court continues our immunity. Uh, we have to be proceeding uh, in what is a, 
what is perceived as a level of good faith in terms of trying to meet the need that we have and that we can see. And uh, the report, one report is due this Friday. Another report, I believe, is due February 18th. And as long as we meet those deadlines and continue on with regard to this, we should be pretty steady in maintaining that status as a good faith uh, participant in the Mount Laurel process and, and there, therefore not suffer any issues with regard to our immunity. Uh, depending upon where we are in mid-March or end of March, uh, we'll have to take that under further advisement in terms of what we might do with regard to the, uh, the existing court order. So just one other question, because I know that the planning board is working on the housing plan, which is obviously something that Matt has to submit, and just wondered where we were with regard to the planning board completing the housing plan and the Halloween component of it. Is that your uh, last question? Yeah. Susan, do you want to? We're working on it. We have to have it by February. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we continue to work on that. Uh, I believe our date is uh, February. Thank you. Early February, sorry. Great, thank you. Good evening. Hi there, how are you? Melanie McWilliams, 431 Bogart Ave. Uh, I just had a couple of quick questions. Um, with respect to what a couple of people have said about this, the time of year and the studies and whether or not uh, this is it, well, whether or not it's a convenient time of year to do these studies. Um, and somebody said, what's the rush? I, I'm questioning, um, my question really is kind of, if so, we have had no snow and we've been very lucky so far, but if we get dumped on in a couple of weeks and in the middle of while they're doing these studies, do they postpone for a day or two until streets are up and moving? Um, and if there is no rush um, and we, you know, what, why can't we wait till, you know, the gentleman I believe from Mazur had first said he was told they have four weeks or they, they had to be done within four weeks. Can there, you know, is there an extension on that given the fact that this time of year isn't really conducive to a lot of outdoor car traffic, especially if snow comes? Is that your last question? No. <laughs> Ask all your questions, make your statement, then we'll, we'll respond after. Okay, and, uh, well, that, that doesn't always happen, so I was just trying to make sure. Um, uh, the stuff that you said you were working on, the housing that would be talked about in mid-February, is that the affordable housing? Yes. Yes? No. Can you please just, this is public comment, so if you could just make your comments, ask your questions, and then if, if necessary, we'll respond. Okay, I guess my comments are, I still have not heard, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm missing a piece somewhere, but I'm missing, where is our affordable housing going? I know we don't know yet, we have extensions till the end of March, so I'm sorry, Roberta, you look so bothered by my comments. No, no, um, no, I'm actually really sick. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, too. I have some kind of flu-y thing, so I'm running... I'm not Okay. Um, well, that, those are my questions. I'm con I have concerns about affordable housing. I have concerns about that, our affordable housing obligations, what's going to happen, where it's going to end up, where is it going to end up when we build these other... How, how is it going to be built in? And I feel like, you know, it doesn't... It, I know it's up in the air, but I'm really concerned about that. And I also just wanted to clarify about the studies. If there's no rush, can these, can the traffic people in particular be told that maybe that's a component that can be done a little later in the process um, in the spring so that we can get an accurate, you know, I know soccer and sports and stuff pick up in the spring. We'll get a more accurate view of what it's like to be out and about traveling in Ridgewood if they have say eight weeks to do it or, or however long, and the re beginning, the other studies can be done in the, be in the beginning, starting now. I understand you're, you're not trying to rush them through, but doing traffic studies in the middle of January or February when it's freezing and snowy is, those aren't, they're not gonna be accurate. Those are my last comments. And, and if you feel you could answer a question or two in there, that'd be great. As far as the traffic studies go, I think I said earlier, and I think somebody on the other side here said earlier, we have traffic engineers and experts. They will not do a study if they don't think it's the appropriate time to do it. Um, so I am not, I do not hold an engineering degree in traffic. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, you know, you go with your, you go with your professionals, 
view on this. Um, and they have not expressed a view to us that would preclude us from doing traffic studies. Now, of course, if it's snowing out, <coughs> We're not, not going to do with that completely. If we can tell all these experts what they should do and when they should do it and how many counts they should do, well, then maybe we should do it ourselves. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand. We wanted experts, and now I'm hearing lots of suggestions as to how the experts should do their work. We just well, want to make sure it's done. Please, please. No, right. you've already, you've already, I, already I know, but question. that's why we have experts. If we can make sure, then maybe we should just do it ourselves and save a heck of a lot of money. Thank you. Can I? I just anecdotally, I would like to say and offer the point that while the studies aren't being um, driven by just affordable housing needs, I think it would be an awesome bonus for the planning board when they're doing their, you know, when we are deciding on where can we accommodate affordable housing and what's the best use um, in different locations. We can use the results of the studies. So why wait till after February or March and get it in the spring because of a perceived um, one month being better than a different month? I think, you know, if we can get the information in time to inform our affordable housing needs, then that's, a, that's such an advantage to us. I'm not saying that it's driving the decision to do when to do it, but we can actually use the information better that way. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, Rick Besh, 64 Park Slope. Um, very quickly, I just wanted to um, underscore something that Martin had said. It's related to something that I'd like to say tomorrow, but I think it's a, it's a key point and deserves a little bit of a highlight. And that is, he mentioned the, the studies. By the way, good meeting, good meeting, appreciate it. He mentioned that the, uh, the study should be framed ultimately in a, in a vision in the master plan. I think that that does get lost within all these details and everything like that. Perhaps that's a little bit natural, it's human, but it is so important that the solutions that we're putting together now remain solutions in five years and in 10 years. And there's not really much discussion about how those guardrails go up to ensure that. And so, you know, and maybe tomorrow, maybe tonight, um, in, in, in coming council meetings as well, I'd like to hear more about how our master plan will actually encapsulate what we want our village to actually be. We can't keep putting more people in it indefinitely. Somewhere it's going to break down and it has to stop. We haven't really talked about that. We are talking about important things. I don't discount that at all. But if we don't put up the guardrails, it will be for naught in X number. Great, thank you. All right, I will motion to adjourn. Second, oh, you want me to make a motion? Oh, I'm, second. I, oh, I'll yeah. second that, second that motion. It's not good morning. Oh, thank <laughs> you, thank you. Wow. No, wait till Hold on a second. Uh, can I just start? Wait, wait, she's got to do the union address. I just like to shout out, I'd like to do a shout out to Dylan. Dylan came in on yes, his Dylan. Uh, to do all of this filming. Thank you. Heather? Do you need to all in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. I think that should be the most uncomfortable chair I've ever spent time in. I think that's why I made sure of meeting. <laughs>